Hello? Hey, Matt. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Chris. Hi, I'm here too, it's Valerie. Okay, I'm here too. Ooh, are you there, Matt? Oops. No, I don't want to share screen. Are you there, Matt? Hello. Matt looks like a, a blinking cloud right now. It looks like his computer's on, but he's trying to connect to the audio. Uh. <laughs> hey, Matt. Let's see. How's everybody? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm just trying to get my screen here right. Sorry. Mm -hmm. There we go. I'm going to start the video. There. Okay. <laughs> that looks a lot better. Sorry about that. Full screen. You won't let us video, huh? <laughs> you should be able to. It says you cannot start video because the host has stopped it. Oh no. That's okay. I'm fine. Fine with me. <laughs> I'll take so care of it in a second here. Are oh, you not going to get on? I hear Jeremy's voice. So right now we have Jeremy, Jamie, Penny, Valerie, and Valerie, and Chris. Wow. And then we have some additional participants as well. I see Deb, Jerry, John Q, Tim Wheaton, a few other folks. Oh, good, awesome. So Matt, when we get started, when people are um, raising a hand, how are you um, going to signal that? Or do I just, I'll just look for a hand raise and- Yeah, I see Chris has got his hand up right now. But you have the call on them? There we go, uh, just a moment. There, I think I should have unmuted everybody now. If you could check in your bottom left corner. Oh, okay. Isn't that something? I don't have a hand. It's uh, yeah, it's in participants and then- Okay, perfect, I got it. It's at the ah. bottom. And then you have to remember to unraise your hand if the host doesn't do it for you. Oh, you shut me off, huh? <laughs> and, if you, and if you look down, you may want to check to see if you can unmute your own microphone and your video. Share a camera. Thank you, Jamie, for... If you, we can mute and unmute, but it's still not allowing us to start video for us. Oh. Let's see. I haven't run into this problem yet. I apologize.
Okay, you should all be able to start video now, I think. There we go. There we go. Hey. All, I've never seen you look better. <laughs> And you should be able to unmute yourself as well as panelists. Okay. okay. So I know it's showing Chris, you're, uh, and Chris and Penny are both muted right now from volume. Yep. So you should be able to unmute yourself if you get the chance. Oh, did you want to hear me? Just in case. Oh, I thought I'd stay muted in case like background noise, like um, ice cubes. <laughs> you can. Chris, I'm glad you can make it in from the shore. <laughs> That's awesome. So we have uh, 21 participants shown uh, as well. So we have the full council and we have Arlene, Cassandra, uh, Clay, Debbie, Debbie Lane, Jerry, uh, John Q is on, Julie Gannon, uh, Levanos, McHugh, Bob Malley, Rory, Sean Murphy, Tim Wheaton, and Tyler Patterson. So welcome. So that's good. I'm good there. I'll put that to the side. Okay. So we've got a few, we have a few minutes here before we start uh, as well. And you should be able to, and, and we went through uh, with the raise your hand uh, portion. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, good, good, good. Just confirm that. <laughs> Chris, Chris's background is killing me. <laughs> That's awesome. So I think we've done better. South Portland did this last evening as well, and I understand they had roughly a dozen people total. So we're we're doing well uh, to start. So I'm glad everybody could get through on the link okay to, to make it through to uh, get to this point. So that's a good sign. And uh, this is recording. So that's a good thing. Um, so we should be able to put this up fairly soon after uh, after this after this meeting, we should be able to get it up and posted fairly soon there afterwards. So, oh, excuse me, uh, Chief Gleason's calling, so we may be having trouble getting in. Hello, Chief. Okay, second. We should have both chiefs on here shortly. They're both logging in. <clears throat>
and it with it being with it being uh, six six o'clock, uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like to get started, we have forty participants now. That's awesome. And we have one hand up. Excuse me for just a moment. Let's see who we have. Okay, Bob Malley is with us. Hi, Bob. I see you had your hand up. And you're muted. Can you hear me, Matt? There, I, can, I get you now, Bob. All right, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there, you should be. You should be unmuted now. Great. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Matt, do you have the um, the agenda handy to just put up on your screen? I do. Let's see here. Great. Can you see that okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and when just a quick question before we get started. Um, when attendees have questions for us, um, I will note them, but then I think you have to give them permission to, to speak, Matt. Yes. Yeah. I see. I see when a hand comes up here. I've got that uh, tracked from the outside. Okay. There we have. Right now we have uh, Frank has his hand up, and uh, if you want to get to Frank once we get to the public uh, portion start part. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So I think we're ready to go. <laughs> um, okay. So welcome everyone to this very unconventional meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council on March 25th. Um, could I please have the roll call? I don't know if we need to unmute Deb to allow for that to happen, but I saw that she is here. I'm just looking for Debbie. Okay, Deborah, you should be good to go. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, here's the roll call. Chairman Adams? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Garvin? <laughs> it looks like he's muted. Okay. Here to go, Councilor Garvin. Okay. Yeah. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. And Councilor Straw? Here. And it looks like if we voluntarily mute ourselves, we can't unmute ourselves voluntarily. <laughs> Good to know. I think that's accurate. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Deb. So we have an, a number of items on the agenda, but if anyone um, who's attending the meeting, anyone from the public wants to comment on something not on the agenda, this is the opportunity to do that. Um, and you can do so if you're participating by raising your hand um, and we can call on you there. 
But do we have a, I see that there are two phone call in listeners. Do we have, do they have the ability also to raise their hands in case they have comments? Uh, what, I'd be happy to, if you, if you are participating via phone, if you do star nine, that would allow you to raise your hand. Okay. All right. So it doesn't look like we have anyone, um, though, oh, it's just, it's Bob Malley has his hand raised. Um, it doesn't look like we have any comment on items not on the agenda, so um, we can just jump right in. I'm going to turn it right over to you, Matt, for the um, first item, which is the social distancing reminder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oops, I did not mean to do that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, this is. I'd like to take the opportunity at this point to remind uh, folks, you know, due to the current regulations where the governor as well as the president have come forward with recommendations, we are strongly encouraging folks to practice the best or perform the best practices when it comes to social distancing. That would be maintaining a six foot radius away from f other people, uh, as well as uh, take the opportunity now to remind uh, folks that, you know, we do want people to get out and, and get a breath of fresh air and take advantage of the sunshine. However, we want folks to practice their best responsibility and their best responsible actions that they can. Uh, we've seen a lot of folks using our, uh, the playgrounds at the school and then at Fort Williams. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna be getting some signs up uh, between tomorrow and Friday, some signage up, uh, uh, advising people who are uh, out there that we are not sanitizing the swing sets and the playground equipment. So uh, it's, we're recommending that people do not use that equipment at this time, uh, as enticing as it may be, but we are not out there sanitizing them. Uh, there's been some other concerns as well with use of the state parks. They're obviously not town property, but uh, as recent as last weekend, Crescent Beach State Park was filled to capacity, at least as far as cars were lined out to Bowery Beach Road. And it's awful difficult to practice the safest, uh, safest approach to social distancing by doing that. And we just really want people to take this serious and to follow their best practices for their protection as well as for others. Uh, and we do have Fort Williams, which is open at the present time. And the concern there is just the pressure and the, and the group of people who are all coming together. Uh, we do need people to, to pay attention to the best practices where at all possible. Uh, by performing those activities and, and following those practices, it should help us all to, to flatten the spread and, and look out for the public health. So that's, that's, that's where I am on that, if, if, if that's helpful. I, but we are really looking for people to do that uh, as best they can. Thanks, Matt. Um, and just for, for attendees and also for the rest of the council, um, we had discussed taking a little bit of a different approach given how unusual this is. Um, we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to comment and question after each item. So after discussion of the council, for those who are attending, um, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions on each item. Um, it looks like Jamie has his hand up. So, oh, Thank you. Got that. Thanks, Valerie. Um, and thanks, Matt. Um, one thing on the social distancing, uh, that I just wanted to add a, a very specific thing that was um, uh, brought to me by a citizen today and asked to be brought forward to the meeting. Um, a number of you probably saw, got some nice coverage on the news um, about the, the um, birthday parades that have been going on in town this week. And, you know, for younger kids that don't uh, you know, don't have the ability to have an in-person celebration for their birthday. Um, so families have organized um, parade of cars going around, which is great. It's a totally awesome thing. Um, the person who brought up the concern to me was was part of one of those parades today that just said um, there were a number of families and neighbors that were hanging out in large groups of kids. They weren't just staying in their cars. They were, you know, coming out of their homes and um, a lot of mingling and things like that. And so, um, well, we certainly don't want to discourage a creative way to, um, you know, help recognize kids' birthdays and, and try and bring some lightness and, and, and levity to uh, the situation. Um, just encourage everybody to be really cautious and careful about those types of things as well. Thank you. 
Um, does anyone else from the council have anything to add before I open this item up for, for public comment or questions? No? Okay. Um, if anyone in attendance has a comment or a question, feel free to, to raise your hand and we will give you an opportunity to bring that up. I don't see anyone. Oh, looks like we've got one. Um, Anne Carney. <coughs> Hi, I, I just wanted to comment about the, um, the use of Crescent Beach in the Kettle Cove area. I've been out walking there just about every day and it does look packed from the perspective of the way the cars are parked, but um, my observation was that people were observing really respectful distances as they were walking along the beach and on the trails. Good, thank That's you. Great. Um, looks like Tyler Patterson and um, just for purposes of record keeping, um, if you are commenting, please give your name and address um, just so the clerk can note that. You're good to go, Tyler. He's still muted, Matt. Oh, this is Barry Patterson. Sorry, I'm Tyler's wife. Oh. Uh -huh. um, yeah, my dog at Fort Williams, cute. Um, I would like to echo that. I've been at Crescent Beach almost every day, and while it looks super crowded, it's been super quiet. And I think the same is true at Robinson Woods. I've got a puppy, so I've been out quite a bit. Um, all the places that I think look crowded from the street um, are actually not. Um, actually, pretty quiet in on the trails or on the beach. And people are certainly practicing um, social distancing. Good, thank you. Um, Bolts, I'm guessing that's John Bolts. <laughs> Looks like he has a hand raised. I'm getting down to you, John. <laughs> test, test, check, check. Still. Okay. Just briefly on the birthday parades, I, I've participated in all of them today. Um, today was the first one. Uh, many people noticed. I'm sure that there'll be reminders about it. I just want to let people know that that's not been typical at all. Uh, I had a great deal of concern today as well. So that's it. Thank you. Um, all right. Any other comments or questions on this item? No. If I may, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead, please. I, I do know we did discuss this at our department head meeting this morning, and uh, both chiefs, as well as uh, as as well as Bob, uh, Mally, and uh, we felt it was just a great great thing to do uh, from the staff side, as well as a good way to show support for the community. So there was a huge staff buy-in, and uh, they really enjoyed enjoyed the activities as well. So it was a nice way to celebrate and try to find some some lightness in this uh, serious moment. So it's been a really well, well received approach. Yeah. Um, it looks like we do have a chat um, regarding short term rentals. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, and I would just say also on the social distancing reminder. I know we've mostly been talking about outdoors and I'm sure everyone's been doing a good job indoors also, but you know, at the IGA, at the CVS, um, those same rules apply, even though it's close quarters to please try to keep six feet between yourself and anyone else. Um, okay, so moving on to the next item, item number five, um, emergency restrictions order on non-essential businesses. Um, this is something for the council to discuss. I did draft up a proposed order which was posted on the website and part of the materials for this evening. Um, the town charter, are you pulling that up right now, Matt? Um, the town charter does allow us with a vote of five members of the council to enact this sort of emergency order. Um, in, in my proposed order, I did include um, a ban temporarily on any short-term rentals 
um, and any other non-essential businesses. It does not include a proposal to have individuals shelter in place or anything like that. Um, but I'd like to, to open this item up for discussion um, and just see what the council thinks about, about the possibility of this type of order. Is that coming up on the screen soon, Matt? Because I apologize, I didn't um, see that earlier today. Okay, it's, uh, it may take me a moment to get there, that's all. Um, it is Article 2, Section 12 of the Town Charter that bestows the uh, power of the council to enact emergency ordinances. And I did uh, speak with the town's attorney, John Wall, and felt that the council was fully, uh, fully within their rights to, to take that approach. Okay, I'm freaking out here. Um, Chris, do you wanna, did you have a comment while we're, Matt's pulling this up or a question? Uh, Sure. Uh, so with respect to all of this, the, the view that I've kind of had has been, um, and I understand the approach that the governor and Augusta have taken, uh, we're, we're a big state and various parts of the state are uh, dealing with this differently and obviously should be dealing with it differently. Um, it, in my view has always been until there's um, community transmission, uh, you take certain steps and then once we have community transmission, we then take uh, different steps. Um, my understanding in, uh, as a town councilor, we don't have any insight into how many cases there are in Cape Elizabeth uh, in particular versus Cumberland County in general. Um, but this is the type of issue where, although I understand devolving power down to the individual towns in many ways works in kind of a federalist system, this is a situation where I feel like things should be coordinated at the Augusta level or at at the worst at the county level. Um, so how to proceed for me, I, I, um, my preference would be if we have everything coordinated with all the other towns in Cumberland County, if Cumberland County was operating in lockstep with respect to the various prohibitions and regulations, that would be the ideal situation for me. Um, so to the extent that this mirrors what Portland is doing, that is what I would want us to be doing at this point because having a patchwork of uh, emergency regulations from South Portland, Portland, Scarborough, Gorham, Cape Elizabeth, where we, where they're different, uh, doesn't seem to make as much sense as if we were all doing something in unison together. Because what happened, we're, we're, you, 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 hand, you hand 500 feet out my door or so when you're in South Portland. So we're all so interconnected as a county, it would be great if all of the towns were working together to the extent Augusta won't simply say, hey, we're gonna impose this on Cumberland County. Um, I'd like to just do whatever they're doing. I'm not interested in trying to, uh, I, I see the value of trying to figure out what the best solution is, but um, at this point, I'm not as interested in figuring out the best solution as opposed to um, a good enough solution. And if they've already come up with a good enough solution, rather than trying to figure out how we should change ours to make it the best solution, I'd rather have us devote our time to making the good enough solution succeed. So are you proposing that we mirror ours based on Portland's? Uh, or uh, I'd ask you and Matt, have you, have you taken, I actually don't know what's in Portland's. I don't know, uh, has, has South Portland done one? Uh, how does it differ from Portland's? To the extent that, uh, so I guess, uh, so Valerie, I, my question for you would be, uh, does this mirror one of the other towns or is it? Is, it's it's very similar to Portland's, but Portland's includes um, a shelter in place order, and this does not. Got it. Great. Okay. Uh, um, Madam, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Uh, Portland, uh, in their yes, in their emergency proclamation yesterday pertaining to short term rentals, uh, passed. Uh, whereas the city of Portland also recommends that persons not advertise or encourage the use of or rental of short term rentals throughout the city for vacation purposes or otherwise. Right, they just made a recommendation and not, uh, didn't include it as, as a ban. Yeah. I guess that, that's another difference. Um, I think Penny, you had your hand up next. Yes, I, um, I 
I agree with you, Valerie, relative to shelter in place. I don't think, um, and I know that uh, that's in Portland, and but I I can't support that at this point in time because I think there are measures that we can take that will um, that will help to uh, reduce uh, people being out and about. I support uh, short-term rentals not being able to um, continue, but we may, if we can't do that, then uh, I would say that they need to instruct anybody who's coming into the area that they need to be quarantined for 14 days. And I also believe that if we're going to do something around short-term rentals, we need to speak to in by the sea because they're uh, still, uh, from my understanding and what I looked at the other day, they're still advertising um, rooms. I also know that there are a number of people who are coming into town to their summer homes uh, because this is the safe haven, so to speak. And so we need to recognize that and suggest as uh, Governor Mills did uh, the other day that anybody coming into the state needs mm -hmm. to, yeah. to quarantine. Yeah. 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 And we also uh, have to be aware of how many people are coming into our town. And I believe strongly that we need to address Fort Williams. Uh, they've shut down beaches along the coast. Uh, we are a place where people are going to want to come and uh, gather. Uh, and uh, we need to do things that force people to act as adults, which is what Governor Mills basically implied the other day. Mm -hmm. um, Caitlin, did you have a comment? Yeah. Or question? Well, I just, I wanted to ask, how is this, what you're suggesting that you drafted different than what Governor Mills put into place about, you know, no more non-essential businesses? Is it just so that we have it further extended beyond what she has done for the two weeks? Or is it just to really hit at the short-term rentals? What, I guess I'm not seeing what the objective is, or what the difference is, what she just implemented and what is drafted here. And then to comment on to Penny's thing about the Fort Williams, I mean, as much as I don't want people gathering at Fort Williams at the same time, Fort Williams is a very big space that offers a place for people to go to have some space you know, for the many kids that are cooped up at home that might need a place to run for a little while, closing Fort Williams takes that away from them. Yeah, so um, it is a little bit different than Governor Mills' um, order. It's, does, it does include the short-term rentals, which I thought was an important thing. And one point that I think has been overlooked as people are coming to Maine is that we may have fewer cases, um, but we also have a significantly smaller population. So even though, you know, we only have, I don't know what it's up to today, 150 or so. 90, yeah, 90. 190, we only have a million people here, you know. So in other states that have a larger population, their larger numbers correspond to that. And we, it's about capacity to handle it. So. I think we definitely need to encourage people to not come here from out of state um, at this time, not travel here. And if they are to quarantine and we may, so the, the purpose of having this order was so that we could tailor it to our town. So I created this document as a starting point, but wanted to get the input of the council on what do we want to include in here? Do we want to include an order that people who are coming from out of state um, self quarantine for 14 days. Um, another difference other than the short term rentals was that in, um, I see Matt's pulled it up exactly to the right spot, but um, it prohibits people from actually entering restaurants. So the food has to be delivered curbside. It can't be at pickup inside a restaurant. Um, just thinking about the spaces that we have here that do sell food, they're very, they're small spaces. So it would be difficult for people to be waiting there inside to pick up the food and also keep six feet between them. Um, so that was one of the differences, but mostly I just wanted us to have something 
you know, I, I agree with Chris that it would be preferable if we had one solution for Cumberland County as a whole, because, you know, we're, we're not that dissimilar from South Portland. But um, since we don't have that, I think it's important for us to have something that does address the unique concerns of our community. Um, oh, and the other thing, sorry, just one more thing, the, the, the timeline. So I, I had put in as a tentative end date May 1st. Um, that's based more, I mean, it's a little over five weeks, but that's based more on this five week window that you see a lot of federal agencies looking at um, rather than just two weeks, because it's likely that we are going to be looking beyond just, you know, April 8th or April 15th, that we're going to be really looking to May 1st as the time that we want to have. I, but I'd, I'd also be open to discussion on including a shorter time period and then revisiting this um, when we come to the next date. Into the mixed roots or the carrots. Um, um, so, sorry, it looked like, I see, I see Jeremy physically raising his hand, but it looks like Jamie has his virtual hand raised. I'm not sure who was first. Go for it, Jamie. Valerie, well, I'm just curious, um, did you consider in your draft of this um, inclusion of hotels and inns? Or was there a reason that you stopped only at short-term rentals? I went back and forth. I initially started with it out. I looked at what Cumberland County was doing. I looked at what other states were doing. I saw that hotels were included um, as a, an essential business in many other places and left them in. Um, so I think what I'm, I, I don't disagree with necessarily the, the point of what what it would try to achieve, but I, I'm, I'm really stuck on the inequity and how it, it doesn't ultimately stop the, stop the, you know, people coming in. Um, I, I, I understand, I, I'm follow, I think more where Chris is on this relative to the fact that we've already advanced to community transmission, um, that it, it's less about stopping it from coming from elsewhere and more about everybody who's here assuming that they already have been exposed and and taking the necessary steps to prevent themselves from either being in a position where they would possibly be transmitting or being in a position where um, others may be but um, I, I, I I'm, I'm really conflicted about the inequity of of one particular type of um, enterprise that draws people from out of town versus others. And as was brought up also, the notion that people who actually own property here have just as much ability, though they've been discouraged from doing it, um, to come as well. I'm, not, I'm, I'm also, from an enforcement standpoint, really curious, and I don't know if Matt or either of the chiefs uh, from a public safety perspective want to weigh in, but anything that's saying that somebody from outside the area has to self-quarantine or have been self-quarantined for 14 days, I have no idea how we would monitor and enforce that. So that's the end of my question or comments. If, if I may, Madam Chair, I'm prepared to respond somewhat to that. We, we did talk about it today at the department head level as well. That is a challenge. Uh, one thing we thought about was perhaps uh, identifying, you know, grabbing uh, host compliance in the short term and trying to get a subscription with them so they can identify them. Uh, the other thought would be also to reach out to all of those that we do know of at the present time uh, to let them know uh, the town council would be taking that approach to say, you know, until May 1st, at a minimum, we're looking to, the town is looking to not allow uh, short term rentals at the present time. And you know, you, you would hope for some self-policing and people looking at that and the seriousness that is there. It, you're completely right that it's a huge challenge to try to have, uh, to try to regulate that or to police it. Uh, but you would hope that folks would understand the seriousness of the situation. Uh, although, you know, notwithstanding the articles we've seen in the paper over the past couple of days uh, where 
the profit motive may have uh, may have uh, outweighed the uh, desire to provide public safety. Um, Valerie, do you have a comment on that? Yes, I um, I, I agree with Councillor Garvin. Um, I'm conflicted about it too, and I see what you're trying to accomplish with it. The difficulty is how do we police it? Are there fines? What restrictions are there? Um, I just don't see how we're gonna be able to do that, right. how we're gonna be able to police it. Um, are we setting up fines for people who don't follow the rules? Uh, also, one of the things to think about is we have um, a big population of um, people who live in Maine and in our community who are out of state right now because they go away for the winter. I have friends in Florida, Arizona, I have neighbors who are in Mexico that are coming back and most of them are over 65. Um, I really think that it's, it's gonna be important for us to urge them to self-isolate for at least 14 days and family members, even though they wanna see grandma and grandpa, it might not be the time to do it. Um, my other thought is um, with a lot of people coming here from out of state that aren't uh, permanent residents, they really should check their um, medical insurance and see that uh, they're covered in the state. I went through that issue with um, my daughter going to school um, out of state. Uh, our policy did not cover her other than um, some of the New England states. So that may be um, an issue that people haven't thought about if they're thinking to, um, to, to come here. Their health insurance may not um, cover them here in Maine. Um, Jeremy, go ahead. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I also would echo the concerns about um, creating the sort of a patchwork of, of different regulations. I, I noticed there's some significant differences between the governor's order and the Portland order on what counts as an essential business. And I, I think there's um, an opportunity to create a lot more confusion than is necessary by having that take place on a town by town basis. Um, one point that I would make relative to that in terms of trying to better coordinate our actions among municipalities is that just prior, immediately prior to this meeting, I received a, a meeting notification from the Council of Governments of a Metro Region Coalition meeting taking place tomorrow morning uh, on that very topic of trying to better coordinate actions among the um, among the, the different municipalities in the region or potentially with the, the county government. Mm -hmm. So if there are particular concerns that, that this group feels should be addressed best at a county level, um, it'd be great to hear that regardless of how, what we take it for action on this item um, so that I can bring that um, and Matt can bring that to the Metro Region Coalition meeting tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, it's tomorrow morning, you said? Tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. You're welcome to join us. I can forward the link. <laughs> um, go ahead, Penny. Um, okay, I think that the reason why uh, hotels are probably considered more essential is because of um, uh, motels on the strip on Route 1 where people who are um, kind of week by week payers that have no other home who live in those, um, those motels, um, those are those are their homes. I don't think in by the sea uh, qualifies as one of those. Um, and that's the only reason I could think that something like that would be essential is because it's, it's somebody's house. Um, and so I, I don't agree with um, uh, distinguishing um, short-term rentals from in by the sea. It's any place that is renting property in town needs to either shut down or they need to be um, uh, conscious of what actions they're taking that are impacting the community. 
Um, regarding enforcement, I think the more and more we use enforcement as, our, as a reason for not doing something says that we may not do things. I, re I really, I strongly feel that um, um, forcing people to shelter at home and, and shutting those kind of things down, you know, shutting people's lives down more creates so much opportunity for social issues that can impact elders, um, children, teens, um, domestic violence, all of those will increase the more we shut things down for people. And that is where I'm going to come down constantly because I don't want to make a decision that puts a person at risk of violence in their home. And Cape Elizabeth is not immune to that. So that's where I come down. So I'm trying to balance. And I truly believe when I listened to Janet Mills the other day is her statement is if we'd all become adults and recognize what our obligation is, then we don't have to take extreme measures. And I will bet that Cumberland County, if we don't act as adults, will be the first county that shut down on a countywide basis. So I personally would prefer taking action that I can live with um, that uh, allows us to understand and balance the risks of uh, forcing people to shelter at home and uh, just figuring out ways that we can keep social distancing. And so that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to balance. So Penny, just to clarify what you're saying, um, you would support some kind of emergency order. You would have a ban on both short-term rentals and hotels. Yes. No shelter in place. Right. Okay. And in terms of enforcement, were you suggesting that, so Portland, another difference between this and Portland is that Portland does impose a, I think it's a $500 fine for violations. Are you suggesting that we have some sort of mechanism like that? I think it, I think it would be beneficial. I don't know what it would look like, but I'm willing to have the conversation about it. Okay. Um, Chris, go ahead. Uh, so I agree with uh, most of what Penny said there. Um, to harmonize the short-term rentals and the hotels, it it pains me to do this, but I mean, this is happening to businesses across the board, and it, it just sucks. But uh, I would say we uh, the, we impose the restrictions on the hotels and the short-term rentals rather than waiving the restrictions on both. Um, and it sucks, it, it, but this the, it, this is a bad situation we're in. And from my recollection, when I was looking online earlier today, I think I saw something saying Florida is beginning to impose quarantines on people coming in from flying in from New York. Alaska is now putting quarantines on people crossing the borders into Alaska. I saw something about Idaho and uh, Washington and something or Oregon or one of those. So it's not like we, us taking this step is not that uh, extreme compared to what others are doing. Um, and it sucks that it will harm in by the seas business, um, but everyone's businesses are being harmed and we, we need to take reasonable steps here. And I agree, I, I wish everyone would just be adults and act appropriately, um, but there's always gonna be the, it, uh, I saw an analogy on the internet the other day. Um, it's like we're all lining up to go out to recess in kindergarten and there's those one or two kids that just won't get in line and you're like, just get in line. If you get in line, then we can all go outside sooner. But if you don't, we're all just going to have to keep standing here. That's what's going on right now. We want everyone to act like adults. Let's see if, let, let's try doing this without doing the shelter in place for now. So I agree with Penny on that. Uh, although I'm really moving in that direction. Um, but but I, I agree with not doing it at this point. And then with respect to the actual document, reading through the exhibit A, it appears with one or two exceptions to mirror what Portland did. So I'm fine with the exhibit A, so long as the short-term rentals and the hotels are harmonized. Um, Jeremy, go ahead. And then Penny, did, I, I don't know if you have your hand up. 
again or if you didn't lower it. Oh, I have it up again because I'm... Okay, so Jeremy and then, and then we'll come back to Penny. Thanks. Um, um, so I just wanted to uh, follow up on one of the thoughts that Penny had um, about hotels. Um, you know, I, 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 it was, it struck me when I was reading through the list of essential services to see that on there um, in the governor's order. And I came to the same conclusion that, that Penny made about hotels uh, acting as people's primary residences in some cases. Um, but I also wonder, um, and maybe this is a question for Matt as much as anything else, um, if there may not be some other useful function in having hotels open as we get to a point where perhaps we need to bring in additional medical workers from other parts of the state or parts of the country that are less impacted or other, and they're going to need some place to stay. Um, so that, that, I guess that, that would be my, my hesitation and question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, so I'll pose it as a question. Um, do you have a response to that? I was just thinking, I mean, we, if that issue does arise, we could always revisit the order and amend it to accommodate that kind of situation. But I don't know if there's been any talk of that so far. That, that would be my, my thought as well, Madam Chair, uh, would be if you wanted to approach that. It has happened in other states where they've uh, deployed the use of hotels uh, in that or similar capacity as far as additional housing. Uh, I did speak with the GM of In by the Sea earlier in the week. They were currently at 15% or less occupancy, so they, uh, and they are act they've actually been considering closing uh, during the month of April due to the low levels of occupancy that they've had. Uh, because of the challenge of keeping it fully staffed and operating uh, versus the amount of occupancy that they need to break even. So they've been considering, you know, they've, they've shut their spa, they've shut their fitness center, they have allowed only for takeout from their restaurant, so the restaurant is effectively closed, uh, and they have uh, very low occupancy. They have one gentleman who's been staying there while his house is being completed, he's been a, more of a longer term. Uh, resident, but uh, overall, I think they may be looking at the same challenges the industry itself is with the lowered uh, lowered room count. So uh, I'm not sure if they would you'd get a great amount of pushback if if you wanted to find equivalency as far as looking at one uh, form of housing versus another. Uh, but it may be something worth uh, you know we're, we're talking about a short term period here to May first effectively. So uh, that may not be a a major battle or it might give them some peace of mind if they were thinking about closing they would probably do that uh they would keep some staff there obviously but uh but overall i think they're down to like three rooms right now um penny go ahead um just one quick co comment because uh we know that people are coming in from um out of state to their summer homes etc that maybe we need to do some sort of um really um aggressive um, uh, campaign, um, which I think Janet Mills also suggested in some areas, that says to the people who are coming into town, this is what the state is requiring of you. Uh, because she said it several times that anybody coming into the state needs to meet the same requirements, which is you need to quarantine yourself for um, what is it, 16 days or 14 days? Um, so we need to do that kind of campaign so the people who are coming here um, to their summer homes recognize how seriously we take this. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, okay, so I'd like to, um, make some kind of headway on this item tonight. I also want to, I know we're, we've taken a really different approach to this meeting. I want to make sure that the public has a chance to comment. So could, um, could the council just indicate by a show of hands if they think it would be acceptable at this point to open this item up for public discussion? Is that? To what? Just open this item up to public discussion um, so we can get some input before we entertain any sort of motion or would we prefer to, I don't know if someone has a motion ready to go and we could 
then have a very quick turnaround on a public hearing on that. Um, but I do think it's important that we hear from the public on it before we take a vote. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So I'm gonna open it up to public discussion and then we can, we'll, we'll entertain a motion, whether it's for, for this order to table it for some amended version of this order. Um, but, okay. It does look like we have a few chats that came through. Um, but does anyone have a, uh, a comment or a question that they'd like to raise at this point from the public? Um, all right. So I imagine we're going to have a number of hands coming up. What may work most smoothly um, is if Matt, can you just go through and, and unmute the individuals who have hands raised in order? We'll, we'll do, Madam Chair. First one is uh, Terry Patterson. Oh, yeah, this is actually Tyler this time. Hey, Tyler. <laughs> we've got us both. Um, so uh, I, I believe we're still in the same, uh, the, the same frame here, but I wanted to talk about um, access to Fort Williams and beaches. Um, if we're working on uh, social distancing, I, I do think one of the opportunities for us is to allow still the folks who are in this town and paying taxes here in this town to have access to those places. We do need outlets. We do need places to go. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but my, my strong preference would be, let's please not take it away from uh, the, the folks who live here because we do need those things to not go stir crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be, be John Volts, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm, get, I'm getting to you, John. Sorry. Here we go. John, John should, be, should be unmuted. Hi. Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'd like to urge the council to consider a shelter at home uh, that mirrors Portland. I do wish uh, Augusta would take action. I do wish the county would take action instead. But if in the, you know, that they're not leaves it to the council. Um, if you look around and look at the data, this could be bad. And the stronger measures you take and the sooner measures you take, the better is the outcome. Things have changed a lot in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, we had our first case in May, March 13th. We're now up to 142 cases. When, you know, testing is still minimal. The virus is here. We have community transit transmission. Um, the, the, if you look at San Francisco, you look at South Korea, we took strong measures for social isolation. The outcomes have been better. You, the sooner you do it, the better. You look at places like Italy and Spain, those are the ones that took a long time and late to the party. I urge you to strongly consider shelter at home. You're gonna have people who don't follow that. You can accommodate things like Portland's where you can you know, go out and you can walk. Um, but I'd strongly consider you know, leading by example and considering a shelter in place as part of the emergency order, like Portland, like Brunswick. Thank you. Next would be Jerry Neller, Madam Chair. Thank you. And if I could just remind people, I know a lot of you have your full names um, as part of your, your username, but some people do not. So please just do identify yourself so that um, Deb Lane can make note of that, your, your name and address for the record. But go ahead, Jerry. Uh, hi, this is Jerry Canneller. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. So just listening to the discussion, I, I just wanted to reiterate again some of the things you're talking about that I would support for Fort Williams Park, given this is sort of a very unusual time, unprecedented and something none of us have actually seen. I would be in favor or support specifically for public health and safety reasons to limiting access actually to Fort Williams Park and, and other CAPE 
attractions and beaches and things like that to, to residents of, of Cape, especially since we have some concerns that there are people that just may not follow the shelter in place rules or social distancing rules, et cetera. So I'd ask the town to consider something similar to that. And then I haven't heard any discussion on the upcoming tourist season here. And again, I'd be in favor of banning commercial traffic in Fort Williams Park and to other Cape tourist attractions until you know some period of, of time as we see this unfold and follow the metrics. So um, I thought I'd sort of offer that. I think the Fort Williams Park is one of the items I had on my agenda here to talk through, uh, to, to understand that a little bit better and, and to reiterate another point earlier, I'd rather overreact at this point and be wrong than, than not consider uh, some of these steps such, such as this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so it doesn't look like we have any other hands up um, among attendees. Chris, uh, did you have something? Uh, yeah, so I was curious, um, uh, did, I know Portland did the shelter in place, did Brunswick as well, Matt, if, um, if you know. Um, and uh, as I noted, it's the, uh, I could, I would understand us in, um, going with a shelter in place order, but it in the issue it boils down to is how effective is it when South Portland isn't doing it, when Gorham isn't doing it, when Falmouth isn't doing it. And I, and I totally hear the argument from Jerry and John, which is, well, be, lead by example. Um, it, and it's an argument to be made, but if it's, it, it goes with Penny's point where there are already reports coming out that we're having skyrocketing uh, child abuse issues around the country from people being locked in their homes. And it's an incredibly stressful situation for adults and they're dealing with the kids and the, it, with the situation. It, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a uh, toxic situation that is being created that is going to have a lot of rep repercussions for our society. Um, so given that you, and you put them all together, it's, it's a pretty, pretty close call for me. Um, but absent organized, um, coordinated action by the county, us putting in these patchwork things, yes, maybe us doing it will help push it over the edge where uh, Augusta says, hey, we're gonna do this for all of, Cum uh, all of Cumberland County. Um, but absent that, I think, okay, well, what's the worst case scenario? What's the downside here? If basically we're saying uh, the United States, we say people have freedom, you have freedom to go do things, um, but yes, freedom comes with the fact that you don't have freedom to impose your actions and uh, the consequences of your actions on others. But with this disease, if you choose not to quarantine, if you choose to go out in society, you're gonna potentially get infected. Uh, and the downside is you might infect other people, but if we've told everyone shelter in place, but we're not gonna enforce it, people that are being responsible should be sheltering in place. It, the, the other downside is the impact it will have on our healthcare system, and that just sucks. It, where basically if people choose not to follow the shelter in place, they're gonna impact the healthcare system. So putting all that together, it's just a really close call. Um, and I'm seeing John's point lead by example. It's a really close call. So that's my comment. Okay. And it looks like we had another comment from the public in the chat, um, noting that um, relatives of sick Mainers may need a hotel to stay in um, also. So, all right. Returning to the order. Um, would anyone care to make a motion? Oh. I'm also happy to make some sort of motion, but I don't know if someone has, would anyone care to make a motion um, either to um, enact this emergency ordinance, um, to enact an amended version, something of that sort? Madam Chair, if I, if I may insert myself for a moment. Uh, apologies. Uh, one thing I would say is with this type of uh, action, it will take account of five uh, counselors to, to vote. And then with the uh, with the luxury of a video meeting that we're ex experiencing this evening, uh, 
uh, town clerk Deborah Lane will have to call call the roll in case there is a vote. So each individual will vote uh, with the chairman having the prerogative to vote at the end after all the other councillors have voted uh, for what the council's uh, actions have been in the past. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, that's right. We do need a we do need five um, for this particular type of ordinance. Um, okay. I'm not seeing anyone. So I would like to make a motion to approve the emergency regulation prohibition on businesses with the following amendment to in strike hotels from those uh, businesses that are considered essential. Um, yes, that would be the motion. Looks like Penny has her hand up. I, I put it up so I could second your motion. Okay, thank you. All right, discussion on the motion. Um, I think a lot of hands moving. I thought it's not Jamie, but it looks like that's down. So Caitlin? I, I just wanna make sure, so you're just eliminating all of 27, is that what you are putting in your motion? Yeah, let me just pull it up on a different screen so I can see it entirely. I have it up there now, Madam Chair. Okay, yes. Um, yes, so we would eliminate 27 from that list of essential businesses. Okay, and then the only other suggestion that I would have is that we don't list agriculture. Um, we, we put food cultivation and processing, including farming, livestock, and fishing, just to be more consistent with what our other ordinances are. I'd like to see, to make sure that agriculture is listed as an essential business in there. Okay. Um, so I could, I would amend my motion to make that amendment. Um, on item three to add agriculture. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't watching the hands. I think Penny had her hand up. I just, uh, I just want to clarify, just so everybody is aware, that agriculture includes horticulture uh, from a state level, just so everybody knows. Um, what could you just clarify what distinction that would make for but that the what that like means that? what that means is and and I don't disagree with this personally but I just want people to be clear and not be confused when they see that there are um, uh, people such as the Tamaro doing um, some type of uh, landscaping, they are considered horticulture. And that's agriculture under a state definition. Okay. And the other thing, and I don't know where it fits in here, is that there are businesses in town that one might consider non-essential that have taken precautions to ensure distancing. Um, and um, I will use LP Murray as an example, uh, that they have taken the precautions where their workers really never come in contact with each other. And their trucks are really their offices. And so they're moving uh, in and out of town and from, an operations perspective, um, they're recognizing the importance of what um, what needs to be done in order to ensure the safety of themselves and the community. Um, they don't gather at all in their um, their uh, shop, so um, I think a business such as that needs to be um, 
um, brought up as a example of number 25 yes construction we aren't trying to shut down all business we need to recognize there are things that need to happen so <clears throat> I don't want people to question trucks traveling around town right possibly number 23 as well as as they would be doing work on infra infrastructure oh uh, exactly perfect you know, Thank Scott Dyer Road phase two will be starting uh, April 6th hopefully so we don't want to shut them down we'd like to get that completed and exactly. they will be spread out. <laughs> um, Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I would um, prefer not to alter, although I understand um, Caitlin's uh, uh, concern, I prefer not to alter three uh, just because it does mimic what the other communities have done uh, as it was currently drafted. And it, se and it seems like almost everything is encompassed and although I do hear the concern of, oh, well, let's get it match our ordinance language. Um, but like farm stands and produce stands are covered in two and food cultivation, as Penny noted, um, that, that's, we, we don't need to worry about people raising ornamental flowers and making sure that that's still in operation. And it seems like Tamaro and some of the other stuff to the extent that it's a construction project, if they're putting in pavers or something like that, it seems like that's encompassed uh, by number 25 and like house construction, it seems like that's encompassed by 25. So I, I'd prefer to leave three alone, but, um, I don't feel strongly about it. Good. Okay. Oh, and sorry. And last point is I, I'd love to hear each of you just weigh in on, um, how you, how you feel about the, uh, the shelter in place aspect. We, we've kind of talked around about it, but, um, so I, although I know how I would vote for it as what we have as drafted, I'm curious as to how anyone feels about shelter in place and whether that should be added into this or not. Okay. Anyone want to comment on that? Caitlin, go ahead. Um, I'll comment just, I don't know if your amendment to change three to agriculture ever got uh, second, but I would second it so that that could move forward. <laughs> and then the other thing to Chris's shelter in place, I don't think we we need to go there. I think this here is a, a step in the right direction, and I think the a full shelter in place ordinance or, or order is is not appropriate at this time. Okay, uh, Jamie, go ahead. Matt, um, or and and with support from Chief Fenton or anybody else, could you maybe detail for everybody exactly what that means? A shelter in place order, what would be encompassed, what what sort of latitude we have, all that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, Chief Chief Fenton is on the line. He may be uh, best to answer that uh, just from the enforcement capacity, as well as some thoughts uh, regarding the question on uh, domestic. Uh, domestic issues that are arising due to the tensions uh, from uh, the current situation. And yeah. he, he's online. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I in? Okay. Yeah, the, um, I've spoken with some other communities who are in the process of doing that, and they're basically taking their enforcement from an educational level. There's no, um, other than that, really strict enforcement. They're basically bringing to people's attention as a reminder, as an educational uh, aspect, but the strict enforcement. And because once again, um, any officer interaction with citizens is, uh, as the phrase that goes now, seating, where you are across, causing an interaction. Again, social distancing is tough to do when taking enforcement action. Um, so, and there's going to be people who, once you start to what they view as right, wrong, or indifferent, encroach upon what they believe to be their civil liberties, you are going to find people who are going to intentionally violate it and look to antagonize law enforcement or challenge them. Um, so that is a host of challenges for our officers when you do these things. So I just wanna look at it from a boots on a ground perspective as well of how, what level of enforcement you would like from the police department, how you would like to pair that um, because there are gonna be challenges. And uh, also to speak to what Penny spoke to as well is um, when people are confined to the same home for long periods of time, you do see rises in uh, because of the stress, mental health issues, 
Uh, you're going to find people who just need a break, who need to get away from their kids or their significant other, um, because you are going to see a rise in, uh, I think, some domestics and some uh, family disputes. So I don't want to, uh, I want to be aware of those situations as well as we're considering any type of shelter in place and how that might impact it. Um, anyone else from the council want to comment on this? Could, could Matt, or, or I mean, if anybody else knows the answer, I, I, I think it's a phrase that we're throwing around without a lot of specificity. That's all. I'm, I'm, before we weigh in with what our position is on it, um, I'm, I'm hoping to put a finer definition to what exactly it means. That's all. So I think Portland did include um, something more specific about the, and I know that the Bay Area did have something specific, but it's essentially, we would, would want to define it in our order, um, basically not leaving your house except for obtaining essential goods and services or medical care, I think is what they settled on. Um, let me just see. And that, that, from, an, and from an enforcement that, perspective, that's going to be difficult to just stop people and try to figure out where they're going and what they're doing. Um, but it's a good, a good idea to, uh, to uh, encourage people to do those things. But as far as there's a difference between encouraging, guiding, and then enforcing. And the enforcement aspect is what's going to fall back on us. So I just want to make sure that we're clear about how we are anticipating doing that. Right. Um, Okay, Matt, did you have something to add before I have Chris jump in? Just uh, following up with your definition, Madam Chair, uh, just looking at people can, you know, they're, they're looking to have residents required to stay inside and can go out only for necessities. And that would be such things as medical care, uh, supplies, and uh, the bare, bare essentials, but uh, no more than that. Right, and exercise and dog walking. As well. <laughs> Um, in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, that was, that was identified. <laughs> yes. uh, go ahead, Chris. I was uh, typing up what I'm reading from the, uh, the, I'll just say it out loud. So I'm looking at the Portland one. What it says is, if I'm reading this correct, I'm looking at the right document from the Press Herald. All individuals currently living within the city of Portland are ordered to stay at their place of residence. To the extent individuals are using shared or outdoor spaces, they must at all times, as reasonably possible, maintain social distancing of at least six feet from the other person with whom they don't share a household when they are outside the residence. All persons may leave the residences only to access COVID-19 essential services or as otherwise expressly provided herein. Individuals experiencing homelessness are exempt from this requirement, but are strongly urged to obtain shelter and be at least six feet from any other person to the maximum extent practical and possible. And then on the next section, it mentions um, the point about outdoor, uh, the next section, section five, mentions things like how you're allowed to travel and then outdoor exercise or dog walking is specifically permitted and you're encouraged not to congregate, a bunch of other stuff that basically gives the exceptions and some fleshing out of the prior one, but it is ordered to stay at their place of residence. And so I guess one, one middle ground would be if we said um, strongly urged to remain in their place of residence, which is an, avoiding an outright pro, um, order, but is basically saying, do it, if, if at all possible. Yeah. Um, that's sort of my feeling on it being cognizant of the, the issues that do exist in domestic violence situations and other household situations that may not be ideal. Um, but I do think that going a little bit overboard in this case is not the worst thing and probably is beneficial to all of us. So I would support some kind of shelter in place, whether it's a, a re strong recommendation or something that's actually in the order. Um, Valerie, go ahead. I agree with you, Valerie. I, um, I think we need a strong recommendation urging people to um, shelter in place as long as they know that that includes um, the exceptions. They can walk their dogs, they can do all of that. 
but I think that um, right now we need to make it a really strong um, urging of that. And we have um, another council meeting coming up in just a couple of weeks. We can readdress it then too. Yeah. So I'm going to um, move an amendment to my motion to add to the last paragraph of the order. So the last paragraph begins, it is hereby encouraged but not specifically regulated that all citizens or visitors of the town of Cape Elizabeth take all necessary steps to care for themselves and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, I would add a sentence after that to note, um, residents are strongly recommended to, Chris, do you have that language handy from Portland? Uh, yeah, I think, hold on a second. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, all individuals currently living within the city of Portland are ordered to stay at their place of residence. Okay. So I would add, I would add um, all residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth and um, any temporary residents or visitors to the town of Cape Elizabeth are strongly urged to remain at their place of residence or abode except to access essential or COVID-19 essential services. Madam oh, Chair, go ahead. If, if I may, Madam Chair, could I ask for one other uh, fine, uh, fine point of reference to be uh, amended from trash collection to public works under number 22? Yes. Trash collection, what is it that uh, you're proposing? To, to public works operation uh, that way because we don't do trash collection right, here don't do that. yeah public work yeah um, thank you and then going back to that other paragraph um, I would further add uh, that being outdoors for the purpose of exercise or dog walking is, is does Portland say is considered a, a COVID-19 essential? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, subsection four says uh, you're ordered to stay in place basically, except as otherwise uh, exempted or provided. And then subsection five then says you can go uh, do outdoor exercise and dog walking. So presumably it is one of the exceptions that was referenced in four. Well, I think, okay, so I'll just leave it at that, that one sentence added. Did you happen to type that in, Matt? I'm trying to catch up with where you were at on that. So it's just in the, in the last paragraph of the order itself. Okay. So right in here. Such steps only, but like the one just above the signature date, uh, the, the date and uh, time. Right. So after that first sentence. Okay. Um, to add a second sentence that uh, the all residents. Or should it be after that sentence because the such is referencing the first sentence. Such steps. Oh, yeah. So between outdoors and such, towards two thirds down there? Yes. So all residents? All residents. Um, are strongly urged. Of the, I wanted to put all residents, temporary residents, and visitors to the town of Cape Elizabeth. I think we need an of in there too to make it grammatically correct. Yeah. Let's okay. jump in yep. on that. <laughs> um, right. Temporary residents and visitors to the town 
of Cape Elizabeth um, are strongly urged to remain in their residence or place of abode except to access COVID-19 essential goods and services. Okay, um, great. So those were two amendments. Penny, you have your hand up. Is that a comment or a second? Oh, it's a comment. I'm sorry. That's okay. All these things going on on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's unusual. <laughs> um, okay, so what this is, what this is saying then, um, and tell me if you want me to wait for my comments after this second, because I'm not good with rules. Um, um, what we're saying then is basically what we assumed people were doing, correct? Yes. The only thing we're doing away with is birthday parades. <laughs> <laughs> it, I mean, that's a real question. Um, um, and I'm not opposed to that. I'm, I'm not opposed to that at all. I'm just trying to kind of um, hone in on what we're saying is that um, the um, activities beyond these things cannot occur. So uh, people can still go to the playground. They can go walk their dogs at the fort. They can do all of those other things. It's just the birthday parades. Well, I think, I, I don't know, just, Chris, did you have a comment on that point? Uh, so I'd, I'd say, uh, first off, I'd just say I'll second the motion just to get us rolling. Okay. Um, and then comment on the point. Um, so I guess myself and uh, Valerie Devereaux, I don't know if she's doing the same thing, because our houses look right out on Shore Road in that basically it's now the sidewalk where we are, not the Shore Road path. But I just see people walking all day long right now. That's exercise. It, 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 some of them are when they approach others, they um, they they maintain a distance. Others are interacting and chatting. In I also see groups of people that are not familiar units that are walking with friends and interacting with friends. So yes, uh, what we had was we want you people to be we want everyone to be reasonable. But what I'm seeing is there is, it's not gatherings of six or 10 or 12, but I'm seeing lots of uh, inter social interaction going on in town, firsthand outside my window each day. Um, and so do we go with an order or not with the order? It's, uh, it, it goes to the point that we don't have an, we don't have an organized response at the state level. Uh, we don't have an organized response at the county level. What we're, what we're all, there's ultimately, we had a couple options that we as a, a species or society could be after. Option number one was to try to eradicate this thing. It's, in my opinion, too big. We're not going to eradicate it at this point. So option number two was uh, come up with a vaccine, and we're working on that, but that's six, nine, 12, 14, who knows how many months out. So then option number three was, as they keep talking about, flatten the curve, try to slow it so we don't overwhelm the hospital system. So in doing that as we slowly build up our herd immunity until the point where we hit that 50, 75%, whatever it needs to be so that we do have herd immunity because it's a kind of a binary thing once we hit the magic number. So when people are going out and doing things that myself and my family are not doing, we're staying in the house. We're, not, I mean, we're, we're going out and getting groceries when we need to, but we're trying to avoid interacting with people. So we're doing what we, are, we can to protect ourselves. If other people are going out and they're exercising their freedom and their liberty, as the chief noted, and a lot of people, if we say you can't, they're going to react with, oh, yeah, yes, I can. I, it, there are some people that will react that way. If they infect themselves, it's, it's, it's a bad way to phrase this, but on one hand, it's good because of the fact that if they get over it, it will help move us towards herd immunity. On the other hand, it's bad because if things go south with them, it will overwhelm our hospital system. So with that, I, if, if the motion had been order uh, shelter in place, I would support that. This I will support as well. 
Uh, the shelter in place one, it's really, really, really close for me. I much rather would have seen it done at the county level or from Augusta. That's not gonna happen. So I will, I will go with either of the two. Um, it is what it is. So that's my thoughts. Um, Caitlin and then Penny. Oh, I was going to, what row was that? that was so long ago? Um, <laughs> oh, when you were typing in and you finished your sentence, were you going to add in about the exercise and the dog walking, or is that included somewhere in COVID-19 essential good and service language that I'm missing? Because, and then unfortunately, Chris, I think even with this shelter in place, you got to let people go out and walk and there's no way to stop people from talking to the people who are walking <laughs> with them. It's just a matter of getting education out there and getting people, you know, to be adults. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to add that and that was all. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. I get it there now. Chris has yeah, all those dogs cooped up. <laughs> Does your uh, second still stand? Yeah, I, I, I second the, the, the as uh, amended amendment. Um, Penny, did you still have a comment? Um, no, I think uh, I think we can proceed. I, I, I'm fine at this moment. Okay, so we've got oh, Jamie. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I just I just want to point out, and I I, I want to be clear that I'm not opposed to the clear objective that I know that we all share of um, ensuring community health and well-being and safety. The, um, hold on one second. The, uh, the exceptions that we've listed out here, though, are wide enough to drive a coronavirus infected truck through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Blow the whole thing out of the water, though. I mean, so I, I, I come back to the what I said earlier about the fact that um, from what I understand from listening to the public health experts who have all acknowledged that we have community transmission in place at this point, that it's incumbent upon all of us um, to consider ourselves as if we've already been exposed and even more so as if we might already in fact have it even if we don't. Um, particularly given for how long people can be asymptomatic um, uh, uh, if they are infected. And that it's much more, I, I think we as a, a, a governing unit should be much more focused on what can we do to really get people to uh, you know, take more personal responsibility and adhere, adhere to the recommendations that are being, being given to us um, versus putting what I think ultimately becomes a somewhat arbitrary um, regulation based on the number of exceptions to it. And again, I, I want to be perfectly clear. I, 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 I want to do everything that we can to make people safer. I think, I think for a lot of the things that we're looking at in this um, resolution here, we're, we're beyond the point of that making material impact to the situation. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I, like I think shelter in place, frankly, is, is the more appropriate action to take because you're encouraging, strongly recommending or even compelling people to stay where they are with the exception of a few set, um, you know, things that they need to do to obviously sustain themselves. Um, but all of the other things I think, um, you know, if you look at some of those businesses that are exempted and I, I understand that you know, even even what the state is defining as essential services, you know, they're the ones providing some of that guidance and some of our neighboring communities are leaning on that to, to craft these kinds of regulations. But many of those places are some of the highest risk places that one could consider. So I, I also, I mean, I know, I, I know you all share the same frustration and I've heard Chris say it and I'm sure many of the rest of you do as well that I think it's patently absurd that we're even at a local town by town level having to have this discussion. And I know no, we're not gonna accomplish anything around that tonight, but I mean, the fact that there isn't a more comprehensive uh, and, and uniformly applied set of directives 
um, and, and that we're just patchworking this together town by town um, with, you know, people, you know, as well-intentioned as we are that are certainly not experts in this arena, I think is, is frankly crazy. But anyway, I'll, I'll get off my rant. <laughs> Um, Penny, go ahead. Okay. Um, I agree with um, Jamie in the fact that um, we have been asked to act as if we have it. And I think that was a very, very um, profound way um, for uh, Maine CDC to put that out there. My understanding as a community is that we're pretty well educated. We have uh, uh, many of the citizens are college graduates, um, advanced degrees and doctors um, and lawyers. So therefore I make the assumption that we're all, we all understand those things and, um, and that we can take that and put it into action. Um, and, uh, and then we can think about our neighbors and we can think about our community without government having to tell you that you need to stay in your house. Um, and so I think some of the, what we've done here in that last paragraph is really, um, create a stronger comment about, come on people, pay attention. Um, because we strongly suggest this, um, we aren't telling you to do it, but we're, we're encouraging you to do it. Um, and, and I can support that approach. I cannot support in a community like Cape Elizabeth that is intelligent, educated people that we need to tell them what to do. Um, and I'll go back to my initial comments and Part of it is because I don't want to see the social ramifications of that type of statement. Well said, Penny. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, so short point, uh, agree with uh, much of that. And I would just note the one fact, one piece of information that we're really missing that helped that really, from my perspective, uh, uh, cripples our ability to make a really good informed decision is I, I've assumed the main CDC in Augusta know the actual addresses of the people who have tested positive and as Penny and Jamie noted we just all we've been told to just act like we have all been infected and proceed accordingly but we don't know how many cases there are in Cape uh, even confirmed we don't if we say it's going to be larger than that, is there one confirmed case? For all we know, of these 70 or 80 in Cumberland, maybe 12 of them are in Cape. And absent that information, we're flying blind um, as to how prevalent it is. So we're just left to assume, oh, but we all have it maybe. Who knows? Can I just make one point real quick as we're discussing this? Um, if we can just break down what we're going to deem as exercise, I know that I'm already uh, getting a ton of phone calls. Is exercise two people playing tennis? Is it three people playing basketball? Is it one person running? Five people riding bikes down next to each other. Those are calls we're already getting from the public, uh, hoping for us to take some type of enforcement action or encouraging people to stop their behavior. So three kids kicking a soccer ball that, aren't li that don't live in the same household, I think we're gonna start splitting some hairs with residents when it comes to what is deemed exercise and reasonable and not reasonable. I'm guessing that's why Portland included that, uh, that other clause about individuals who do not reside in the same household. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I know these calls have already started, so I know they'll continue and increase. <laughs> Although as it stands, it's just strongly urged. Uh, right. But good point. Um, I, I'm, I'm not inclined to amend anything else about it um, because it's strongly urged and not an order. If it was an order, I think it should be far more clear, but we do include eliminating unnecessary gatherings, all social events, remaining at a distance from six 
of six feet from one another in public spaces, including outdoors. So I think under the circumstances, it is pretty much covered in there. I agree. But yeah, and I agree with you also with that, Chris, that this should be coming from a, a higher level and we shouldn't be doing this town by town, but I'm hoping that if we do, it will urge the higher ups to maybe act the way that they should be acting. Um, okay, uh, Jeremy, did you have a? I, I just wanted to follow up on Chief Fenton's question quickly. Um, so this is, the wording of this is strongly urged and I uh, wanna make sure that, that the chief feels like he has the clarity he needs. Um, to provide the appropriate level of public safety education through the police office um, to, you know, basically to help us enforce this ordinance. Um, are we asking, do we need to, are, are you asking us for a greater level of specificity, Chief, or is this, does, does this provide you the necessary guidance? No, I, I think, I think this is going to, this will provide what's necessary. I think it, you know, the goal is going to be for us to provide education and gain voluntary compliance with everybody. And I just hope that the citizens are going to understand that as well. There is going to be some frustrations on our parts with this, but um, but I think it's it's significant enough. I think it's clear enough right now for us to enforce. Um, I'm not sure whether Penny or Caitlin was next. I think okay. it was Penny and then yeah, Penny was Penny was first. Do Caitlin first. <laughs> I was just going to call the question. So go ahead, Penny. Damn it! I forgot my question. <laughs> um, I'm going to unraise my hand while I remember what I was going to say. Okay, go ahead, Caitlin. Well, I was going to say, let's just vote. I, I was about to call a vote. So, Penny, if you have a question. I remembered. I remembered. <laughs> um, here's one thing that um, I think about as you look at um, what's happening in Portland and what will potentially happen in South Portland, that nobody in those cities are saying people can't get in a car and leave town and go walk their dog on Crescent Beach or at Fort Williams, or I think we just need to be cognizant of that wave could start, could start happening. Um, I, I'm not saying we need to make a decision um, right now, but I think we need to be aware that as other communities close things down, we are going to become more attractive to um, people coming into, into town. And I know we can't close our borders, but we just need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'd like to call a vote on the motion um, as amended. And I guess so Deb will have to go through the call. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. So it'd be Councillor Devereaux. Yes. Councillor Gabrielson. Yay. Councillor Garvin. Nay. Councillor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councillor Penelope Jordan. Yes. Councillor Straw. Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. As I understand it, the motion would pass six yay, one nay. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for discussing that thoroughly. And so to, and so to be, oh, sorry to interrupt without raising my hand. And so to be clear, we're, we have treated it um, as one full motion as opposed to that being a separate amendment to the underlying motion i think so because you made a you made a motion to modify to add the strongly urged to remain so are we treating that as the vote for because i'm going to vote yes on both but is that a yes on the strongly urged to remain amendment or is that for the entirety we should just be explicit in that we oh yes that's a good point um procedurally sorry i, I went a little bit off track there so we should have had a vote on the amendment, but before that amendment, there was also the amendment to add agriculture. 
Um, so sorry, Deb, but I think we're gonna procedurally, we'll need to go through first the amendment to add agriculture and then the second amendment, which was to add the strongly urge. And also at the same time we had uh, changed trash collection to public works and then we'll have to go through the, the motion itself. Then, the, then you had the initial um, motion was to approve as amendment to strike number 27, which was the hotels. Right. Can we, um, could we take, is it possible to take those together unless someone pulls one out the way that they, you can do with like a in block? Yes, exactly. If you'd like to make the motion to accept the, uh, the amendments uh, in block, uh, I think you'd be fair within your rights, Madam Chair. Okay, so we'll go with that first, that, emotion, uh, that uh, motion to accept the amendments and block. So moved. Second. All right, um, any discussion on that motion? Um, Deb, could you please call the vote? Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? I'm going to say yes, but I really wanted Bob to do trash collection. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. So the amendments on block pass six yay, one nay. Okay. So then the next motion would be to accept or to, to enact the um, order as amended. So moved. Second. Oops. Second. Um, any further discussion on this item? Deb, if you could please call the vote. Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Nay. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. The motion as amended uh, passes 6 yay, 1 nay. Thank you. Um, and per um, the ordinance, that order is effective immediately. I believe, but I had put in the, the actual motion at six o'clock. Six o'clock tomorrow. Six o'clock tomorrow to allow people to to prepare for that. So that's that's in the motion. Um, okay. So hopefully we'll we'll move a little more quickly through these next items, but we do have some more updates. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Matt, for current status of town operation. And I know you have some other um, department heads available to speak to this too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, appreciate the discussion and I will be, uh, I'll try to be brief and direct when it comes to this. Uh, a couple of different things. We did have a department head meeting this morning uh, for quite an extended period of time. We did practice our social distancing and uh, Thank you to the chief, uh, Chief Gleason, for allowing us to use this fire department uh, conference room because that allowed us the space that we needed. Um, next item we have is uh, we're looking uh, consistent with uh, consistent with surrounding communities. Uh, we're looking to uh, extend uh, our current uh, closing of the town facilities uh, with our crews that we do have working with inside uh, up until. Uh, April 13th. Right now we were looking to go until uh, March 27th, but uh, we are looking uh, in light of the governor's recent uh, ideas and ruling that uh, we're looking, as well as surrounding communities, we're looking to go to April 13th and then reevaluating at that point. Uh, however, with uh, community services, the library, uh, the fitness center, and the swimming pool, uh, we are looking to still mirror the school calendar and uh, their closure that they're currently following. So that would bring them up to April 27th. Uh, one of the items that we did find uh, as, uh, you know, we are looking at all the challenges that we're ex experiencing right now. Uh, once in a while, you do find an opportunity and we're finding this as an opportunity now to actually do our annual uh, breakdown of the pool and the maintenance. So 
We are trying to get that done now. We can get that done safely and with the amount of spacing we need, as well as some tile work that needs to be taken place there that we had scheduled for August, where we normally shut down for a couple of weeks. So we're looking to take advantage of this, this time of closure to get some necessary, uh, some necessary work completed. Uh, so that's, that's the opportunity we found there. And then secondly, uh, at the fitness center during this time period, we're looking to uh, have all the equipment. We've, we've already taken the equipment down, made repairs, sanitized and sterilized, as well as uh, now we're looking to pull that equipment out and clean all the carpets and sanitize the facility entirely during that closure period. So we're trying to find uh, opportunities there as well. Uh, f finally, there's a couple of other items that I'd like to touch on. Uh, as far as uh, general info, there is the main crisis line. Uh, sorry, there's 211 for folks who are looking to find uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, general information, and that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as well as the main crisis line. Which if people are do, do find that they are uh, being overwhelmed or have other challenges, uh, and that number for that is 1-888-568-1112, and that will provide some social services as well as other assistance for folks who may find that they're overwhelmed during this time period. Uh, the other item that we do have is, uh, I, I have invited uh, Bob Malley and Peter Gleason and Chief Fenton uh, to be on the call this evening as well. Uh, I'll have Chief Fenton uh, touch on his when we get the uh, his points later when we get to the update on police department actions and assistance to senior citizens down at number number 10. Uh, but I thought it'd be nice to have Bob uh, Malley talk about what our current operations are from the public works uh, aptitude side of the uh, equation, as well as what, uh, what we're doing at our recycling center. Because I know the council has received uh, a bit of information uh, and some, some comments relating some concerns at the recycling center. And uh, I think it'd be good to have Bob weigh in on that. And uh, again, thanks to him and his crew for Monday evening. Uh, it's not rare that, or it is rare that you get six to eight inches of snow in the, the middle to the end of March. So uh, we were very grateful for his crew to be on staff and we had all hands on deck on Monday night. So uh, if it'd be fine with you, Madam Chair, I'd like to ha have Bob speak. And then after that, uh, Chief Gleason. Great, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. So uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, uh, executing the physical distancing, I'll call it, the uh, protocols uh, as required. Uh, we do have a, a, a large crew, so we've uh, tried to enable that with uh, breaking into smaller groups. Uh, into two different groups uh, and launching tasks. So uh, that's been, uh, the crew's been uh, uh, working within that situation. Uh, we're still uh, getting a lot of our tasks done. Most of our tasks are outside work. Prior to the storm that you mentioned, uh, we've been able to do uh, initiate our sweeping, street sweeping program, which we started last month. So we've got a head start on that. Uh, we've been cleaning the school campus and doing preliminary lawn repairs. So uh, as you mentioned, the storm on Monday night, uh, we do have some staff that has childcare issues uh, that ha have not been able to work, but uh, we had everybody come in Monday night uh, that's involved in the plowing operation uh, to get the job done. They did a, a fantastic job for us. So um, the recycling center obviously is one of our high profile services uh, that the town offers. We are open. Uh, we did close the swap shop and bottle redemption building last Monday. Uh, but as far as at the recycling center, people are still able to uh, bring their single stream and their household refuse. Uh, we did have a concern expressed by a resident about the operation of the compactors and uh, whether that was a concern to patrons and staff. Uh, I did reach out to Eco Maine, asked how they were handling their recycling operations. So far, they're they're doing uh, they're uh, initiating physical uh, distancing protocols at, at their single stream facility. Um, I reached out to Maine DEP, who actually permitted permits our facility, and asked if they had any. Uh, best management practices or guidelines that we should be following and uh, explain to them what we were doing. And they had no concerns about that. The only suggestion that they had was when we're cycling the containers to keep a little bit safer distance or away from them and also to try to keep patrons away when we were cycling the containers. So, but the staff uh, has been doing a great job up there. Uh, they're wearing latex gloves when we do transactions 
and keeping their distance from each other uh, when we have to meet or when they speak with a patron. So, uh, so far everything's been working pretty well. We have had some folks from other communities uh, try uh, or come into the facility to bring uh, bulky waste. Uh, South Portland has closed down their bulky waste transfer station. So uh, we had about a dozen people last Saturday that the staff had to turn away. So I have reached out to the South Portland Public Works Director to see if they could do a PSA announcement to have people uh, stay within their borders. Uh, but uh, that's just an issue that it's a byproduct. I know Yarmouth is having a similar issue uh, uh, with their transfer station. But, uh, you know, I just want to thank my staff. A lot of them uh, are here working 40 hours and uh, they're doing a great job and and we're still and we're still able to offer many of the services that uh, that we traditionally offer. So uh, that that's about it on my end, Matt. Thanks, Bob. And uh, Peter, if you could speak about uh, about what we're doing from the EMA uh, EMA side of it and uh, update the council as to what our efforts are there. It, it's mostly on the EMS side, Matt, as opposed to the EMA side. Uh, the EMA, we're keeping in contact with the county. We are using them as a resource to obtain uh, the extra personal protective equipment we're, we're looking for. Um, they're giving us their daily updates from the state on the spread of the virus and the efforts to contain it. Um, as far as the fire department aspect, we're locked down, as Matt said. Uh, no one's allowed in the building but department personnel. Uh, we are using our Portland Regional Dispatch Center is uh, screening all calls, all medical calls for uh, the coronavirus. And if it's positive, they are giving us a code to tell us that. When we respond on that call, we're only having one provider make contact with the patient um, and see if it is in fact a necessary transport. Uh, we are working closely with the patients and our medical control to uh, not transport them if we don't have to. If they are safe to be at home and can get medication that way, it's better than moving to the hospital. Um, we are doing da twice daily sanitations of the building, uh, daily washing of all our bedding, uh, daily wipe down of all the equipment. Uh, we're working hard to uh, keep people busy. And, you know, our call volume has diminished significantly, which is a good thing. I think we're fortunate in a community that a lot of people have access to uh, a primary care physician, so they're not using us as a resource. So, I mean, basically we're just trying to stay clean and stay, trying to stay focused on what we do. And if we do have a patient, we're trying to make sure that we protect our people. Um, we have had a couple of people that are not comfortable with the current situation and we've managed to replace them with other providers. So we have uh, filled all our shifts so far and I don't anticipate any significant problems unless uh, some of our per diems contracted on uh, their other jobs and that could have an impact down the road. Thank you. Um, great. Um, does anyone from the council have any questions um, for Matt or anyone else about town operations? No. Um, anyone from the public, anyone attending have a question on town? Op oh, sorry. It looks like Jamie's got a question. And then... Sorry. Thanks. Um, Matt, can you talk about um, some of the other, you know, sort of more non-essential services and departments, um, uh, say the planning office or codes enforcement, things like that, people that are um, trying to continue with building projects or things of that sort? Sure, uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to, uh, uh, Councilor Garvin. Uh, we are doing inspections as currently uh, with our, on the code side, Ben is doing uh, you know, a certain level of inspection where he can uh, practice uh, safe social distancing. Uh, so as well as uh, when there are, uh, are, quite frankly, inspections that can't be, can't be avoided. Uh, you know, if someone has a final inspection that they need to, to close on a house, uh, we've been doing that as well as other uh, higher end uh, inspections. When it comes to uh, some of the lower end uh, items such as, uh, not to downplay them, but uh, some plumbing and electrical work that can be uh, satisfied with a compliance uh, form provided by the uh, electrician or plumber, uh, then we're doing that. That's usually early on in the process where uh, the late, later uh, end inspections, uh, Ben has been taking care of those as well. 
uh, foundations, things along those words, some uh, works, uh, framing. Uh, ben is using his best judgment when it comes to that, but trying to accommodate uh, accommodate contractors and homeowners to the best that he can. Uh, from the planning side of it, I know Maureen uh, is doing a lot of the work that does go on uh, through her office, uh, such as uh, getting you know, work done through the uh, Conservation Committee. Uh, they just recently uh, approved an RFP to get some, uh, some trail uh, assessment done. Uh, so there, that work is going forward. Planning board work is going forward now with the advent of being able to have uh, video conferencing such as this. Uh, I think that's gonna loosen us up uh, to be able to, to get some of the more, uh, some of the work that needs to be taking place on those uh, quasi-judicial committees like the Zoning Board of Appeals and, uh, and Planning Board. I know they both have items that are coming forward and we should see them getting uh, back somewhat on track for next month uh, via this this vehicle. Uh, and then uh, from the assessing side, you know, Clint's doing his work from the outside as well as moving forward with his inside uh, work. Uh, when I say inside, I mean the analysis and the work that he needs to do this time of year in-house. Uh, all of the department heads have been, uh, where applicable, have been set up with VPNs. So they are telecommuting as well as uh, taking in uh, time here in the office as well. One of the big challenges has been to try to keep uh, 10 people or less in the building at one, you know, at one time. Uh, so we've been trying to follow that as best as we can. Uh, John Q and I have pretty much been inhabiting the first and second floor of the building on a daily basis because uh, he's been processing the tax payments as they come in. Uh, so that's been that's been going forward uh, as best as we can with the limited staff. But we have had the other tax clerks in. Uh, some of the uh, admin staff, we've been staggering them. Uh, I know Deborah has been doing a ton of work for me uh, during the week as well. So uh, everybody's been keeping quite busy. We are trying to keep operations going forward as best as we can uh, within light of the challenges that exist out there. But uh, uh, where we can, we've tried to get folks to take advantage of online options and walk them through that uh, by talking them through that on the telephone. Uh, as well as uh, one of the, the challenges that every town is facing is new registrations. Uh, lately, the, with the governor's passage of the bill that did allow for cars that were purchased uh, like from a dealership ultimately, and they're, they're running around on say a, a 10 to 14 day flight, uh, they did extend that so people can operate without worrying about being ticketed. Uh, the police forces locally are all well aware of that as Chief Fenton can attest. Uh, so they're not pursuing those as the, as a uh, as a finable offense and letting people go about their lives. Uh, we will catch up with that eventually. Uh, the challenge has been partly with uh, uh, personal car sales. So say I sold my vehicle to another person uh, on a private car sale. Uh, that that is a certain segment that is a challenge. But we are we are working through some of those approaches today to find a way that a person could possibly do that. Uh, either with some social distancing involved or uh, at least in the near term, we we're looking to try to approach that from a, a, a correspondence approach. Uh, so we are doing everything that we can here uh, as, as best as we can. I think the staff is really, uh, you know, like everybody else, people are feeling anxious and tense about, uh, is it safe for me to come to work? and we are working on them. We do have a couple of staff members who have had some health challenges and we've been very sensitive to where they are, where they may have uh, strongly compromised immune systems and we've been trying to find other areas where they can, that, that they can work on uh, to be productive because they don't want to be detached. They want to be part of the team still as well and see where they can help. So that's, that's pretty much what we're looking at inside the, uh, inside the lease town hall. And then of course on the other ends of it, our public safety side, uh, you've heard you've heard that as well as public works. So we are moving forward with that. And uh, community services is, that's a huge challenge there because we do have Cape Care and the aftercare programs where uh, that staff is in many ways, uh, they've cleaned everything that exists out over there for the kids uh, that they've played with. That's all been sanitized and sterilized. So they're ready for them to come back in the eventuality that that happens. So uh, as well as the pool, as I talked about that earlier in the fitness center. Um, Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, you mentioned the quasi-judicial boards. The other boards, um, like uh, the Energy Committee, uh, are they going to be up and running using a similar system in the near term? Especially since I think that's one where we had a big RFP outstanding that I think they were supposed to review. 
Councilor Straw, thank you for asking that question. I appreciate it. We uh, we have they were one of the committees that is overjoyed to have the ability <laughs> to review uh, because they had, they did they had just gone out to a large RFP and one of their big challenges they were saying you know they were saying hey we need to have we want to be able to meet because we have to look at this and come back with a recommendation to council and this all took place right as they were starting to like I think a day before their deadline. So I've spoken with the chairman uh, Sam Milton. And he's he's aware of this now. Uh, they had some question regarding uh, if the work that they were doing could be held in executive session, but uh, we've clarified any questions on that because responses to RFP, there's nothing there that's uh, proprietary because it's a public bidding process. So, uh, but we've got that question clarified. So they're just looking to schedule and use this as a tool as well to to hold their next meeting so they can review the RFPs and keep that work moving forward. Penny and then Jeremy. Okay, um, my question has to do with, and I don't know if it fits under here or whatever. Um, um, I know that uh, Governor Mills postponed the implementation of the whole uh, plastic bag warden uh, bill and everything. Um, I would like to know if uh, businesses in town that are, uh, have been charging five cents a bag for uh, non-reusable bags. I'm making the assumption that uh, because we need to move away from the reusable ones because of how um, germ infested they could be, that uh, that ordinance at this point in time could be considered uh, in um, that we no longer have to charge the five cents for the bag. Thank you for your question, Councilor Jordan. You are correct. We have reached out. CVS was the first one to ask us because of their concern. And uh, we have reached out now, I believe uh, by today uh, to the IGA and uh, and and Cumbies, I will uh, be reaching out to them tomorrow. So uh, we are letting them know that they're not, they don't need to do that at this point in time, uh, especially with the governor's uh, approach on that uh, when it comes to plastic bags. Every town's been pretty much pursuing the same where it has been applicable. So we, we're, we're gonna be no, no different than them. And uh, I know as, as you do as well, April 22nd, Earth Day, they were proposing to eliminate uh, the use of single use plastic bags across the state. So uh, the governor, I think, talked about that as well, but we're, we're not gonna be deviating from that. So we're, we're following the same protocols. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, did you have a comment? Uh, a question for Matt. Um, so uh, I've had a couple questions from um, from neighbors about uh, the status of um, town employees and and pay or or temporary layoffs and things of that nature. Um, could you just speak to that? Sure. At, at this point in time, we we have kept people in in what you call almost like a ready reserve uh, because we do have most folks working at some in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there are a couple. You know, the the library have certain people who uh, you know, if they don't have people checking in, uh, they've, they don't, there's not a lot left that they can do. They've done all the work they can, uh, there, uh, but part of it is at some point, this is going to stop, you know, as far as, uh, an issue when we need to have people ready to open the doors when we can get folks back in and we need to have people who are trained and ready to go. So, uh, Right now, what we've done is the same practice as other communities uh, across. I've been really active on the manager's listserv, seeing what other towns are doing, and they're following similar practices. So uh, we are a small organization, so we don't have a huge amount of exposure. Uh, similar like, like the city of Portland, for instance, uh, they have a large organization. Uh, they've been approaching it that way as well, just keeping their people uh, occupied where they can. But uh, our folks have been looking to do work where they can as well as telecommuting as, as they've been able to. So there are a couple of spots that we have not been able to, but uh, but we do need those folks to keep on board with us. So we have been paying them as they go along. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Amy and then Chris. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. The first is on the bags. Do, do we need to actually vote to take action or, on that or not? I Do we think need to that, vote to suspend that or not? I think that may fall under the manager's uh, purview. No problem. I just wanted to make sure we're doing the housekeeping there. Second is um, there's a few questions coming in on the Q&A function here. 
Um, one that I think is relevant for right now around um, you know, status of town operations, and that's the que a question about the community garden and beyond the um, guidelines for social distancing, are there any other restrictions on use of the community garden? That's growing food. Yeah, I, I think you'd be looking at the social distancing guidelines would be the best, uh, best approach to have there. Uh, def definitely so, and, and I think people, you know, Hopefully the, the soil won't be cultivatable until it's what, Councilor Jordan, you can correct me, but I think it has to be over 50 degrees so before you're gonna get anything to germinate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We may be a while, although we are looking at an early spring, but we will hope, and you know, it may be a good thing to get some signage up to remind folks to, to practice uh, the best social distancing approach that they can when they, do, when they are, are there as well as any other facility. Um, I think Chris was next. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, briefly comment on Matt's comment about um, uh, uh, town staff and just uh, to the, although I understand people thinking, oh, but how, are, are we going to keep having the, these employees where they can't be actively working? Uh, just for people to bear in mind that this has been going on for the length of like a really big snowstorm so far. Um, but yes, it will keep going on longer, but also keep in mind uh, there's always that old adage that it's like 10 times cheaper to retain an employer than to hire, hire a new one. And A, there's what morally is the right thing to do. Yes, we you need to be fiscally conservative with people's, um, uh, the, the, the public fisc, but at the same time, it's a lot more expensive to replace someone than um, in the long run than it is to keep someone on for the next uh, three, four, five months, whatever this may be. So. Um, I personally uh, totally support the direction the town manager is going at this point. And, and just to clarify, Chris, the question that I had been asked was more of concern that people weren't get being paid. Um, ah, good. But, <laughs> yeah. Even better. <laughs> so the other direction. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Penny. Okay, I just want to um, uh, add on to Matt's uh, statements around the community garden, and I agree you know, social distancing and all of that. But I think um, one of the things that um, uh, Governor Mills and others, it's about people need to be able to grow their own food and have access to food. And I don't think we'll be doing anything that um, impacts that ability to have access to food. So I just wanted to say that. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in from the public. So, um, Matt, if you could just touch on the um, budget impact. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd be happy to. I'll, I'll be somewhat brief on this. Uh, I just want to let the council know what we are looking to do is have uh, the first of two budget workshops on April 8th and 9th. Uh, what we're looking at doing is uh, I've, I've been talking with staff. We are looking to do a, almost a complete do-over of what we have for the budget. Uh, it's amazing where three weeks ago, what, where we have uh, evolved into, but uh, I've been working with John, John Q, our finance director, as well as the department heads on revising, revising, and revising uh, what we have planned for the coming year. There are some areas that you know, we, can, we are pushing forward to the next year uh, next year's budget, uh, when we have a better feel for what these next, you know, six to eight months are going to provide for us. Uh, you know, there's a high level of concern, obviously, looking back to the 2000, 2007, 2008 uh, era when the market, the uh, stock market took similar uh, impacts into the community. Uh, we're very concerned about that and, and the impact on the property tax rate going forward. So, we are pushing some capital uh, expenditures to next year that I'll, I'll come back to the council on. Uh, and we are concerned obviously from the uh, couple of different cost centers specifically uh, with revenues when it comes for this current year. Uh, community services is a, is a big one. We're looking at least at at least six weeks of being closed over there with Cape Care and the aftercare program as well as their additional programming that they have. Uh, we do save on some of the expen expense when it comes to uh, uh, outside contractors with programming that we have there, but we are losing a significant amount of income uh, because of the, the revenues that we do have from 
from the kid, you know, from the kiddos, basically. Uh, it's been a big challenge. It's a challenge, you know, and not lost to the fact is that it's an enormous challenge for the parents in the community who do, who rely on such a service. So we don't take that, uh, we don't take that lightly. Uh, it, we're no different than the other communities as well. Uh, they're all pretty much mirroring the school uh, school calendars when it comes to closures of their of their aftercare and before care and Cape Care pro, or Cape Care like programs. Uh, the other areas that we are tracking is we have been in a good shape. Uh, I guess if, if this was the first quarter of the year, uh, we'd be very concerned. But since we're coming in on the last quarter of the year, uh, and we have been in a good, uh, healthy position at this point, uh, we are monitoring a number of the areas that we do have, such as excise and uh, and investment income. Uh, luckily, we were in decent shape when it came to that. Uh, but but that is something that's uh, foremost in our thoughts. Uh, I think we will arrive at, at, at our anticipated revenues for this year uh, outside of this uh, one gap that we do have, but people are still buying cars and we may find that revenue comes in later than anticipated, but much of it is coming on as uh, I, I think we, will, we still will hit our targets. Uh, the other area that we're looking at is uh, property taxes, uh, the revenues there, and we've got that on the next, the next item that we do have on there, but uh, they are coming in. Uh, fairly, fairly strongly uh, on a day-to-day -day basis right now with a due date of April 1st. So uh, those are coming in because a good portion are uh, of those are uh, scheduled via escrow accounts. So um, that thing is coming in. And then ultimately we are looking at all revenues for next year as well in the, in the, in the FY21 budget to see where, where that needs to go and try to come up with our forecasts. Uh, I've spoken with other, other communities and seeing where they are and, uh, we haven't heard anything regarding to revenue sharing. I think we're anticipating the same, uh, what they had forecast, uh, but uh, we are keeping our eyes uh, strongly on Augusta to see if there's any indications. Uh, I'm somewhat buoyed by the, uh, by the most recent uh, stimulus package that was passed, I believe today, uh, and how that is gonna unfold for the municipal and state uh, functions, uh, but we'll have to wait and see until the smoke clears on that as to what that final impact may be for us here at the local level. Okay. Um, and did you want to just touch on that next item too, and then we can go to, to questions? I am grateful for that approach, Chairman Adams. Thank you. I'm happy to. Uh, the one item that we do have is, and, and I thought uh, due to, you know, the council has received as well as I've received some emails from uh, residents who are concerned uh, or questioning about uh, an April 1st due date of taxes, uh, as that is coming right up. Uh, and a thought that I did have on that that might provide some peace to uh, to the property taxpayers is uh, for the council to consider, and because this is completely within your purview, is uh, to push interest being charged uh, uh, like a two-month interest holiday, so to speak. So if a person is unable to pay their second half payment on April 1st, what they normally would do is they would start to accrue uh, interest on that non-payment uh, from that point forward or the amount of the amount that was not paid on so if a person is finding that they might want to make payments uh, in the past what if they said oh, i'd like to make payments to get me up to date by by july 1 or june 1st they'd still be paying interest on the on the unpaid amount uh, this would give people the ability to say if they wanted to hold off uh, or they wanted to make lower payments, not pay the full amount all at once, they would not be penalized for that. It gives them some flexibility between now and June 1st uh, to get to that point. Uh, as far as uh, the collection, there's there are other areas out there. The lien language that's out there, that's all de determined by state law. So uh, locally, you don't have the ability to, to, to change when that is. That needs to be done within 12 months of the date of commitment. Uh, so, uh, if there was going to be a change as far as when a town would lean, that would have to take place on a legislative level. Uh, but in this case, it might allow the town to, if you wanted to push, uh, say in this case, interest payments or, or property tax payments to June 1st, people would be able to do that without being penalized with interest. So that's kind of the recommendation that uh, some towns have taken, taken, that, taken that step. And I think that may be one that the council would want to consider to provide some peace of mind to those who are feeling a challenge. It's, it's not a high level, probably 90 to mid 90% uh, 
taxes come in automatically, uh, but then there's always there's that other gap that exists uh, where folks who may may pay on their own or uh, or they may uh, choose not to pay and go through the lien process annually anyway. So, but uh, that's just, I brought that forward for the council to consider. Um, Councilor Ruiz, you questions for Matt. Yes, Jamie. Thanks. So um, you all saw my email to Matt and John earlier today. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on it for the purpose of the public. And specifically, um, I've had a couple of businesses in town reach out to me uh, on this question of property taxes. So not just, um, not just residences, but um, uh, businesses that are concerned about um, you know, trying to balance their books and don't want to have to lay off employees um, simply because their taxes are due next week. Um, and so um, I was curious um, as we're considering this, you know, in general, what have we seen um, for revenue um, in the way of interest payments and other penalties? And as you all saw um, from the numbers, I, I was, surprise, it's, it's rather low. And I think it goes to the point that Matt was just making about how such a high majority, um, almost in their entirety of our taxes are collected by way of ex escrow payments instead of direct payment. Um, but um, in the past three fiscal years, um, there hasn't been a, a half year of taxes that we've collected more than um, just less than $29,000 in interest and penalties. And that was in 2018. Um, so it's a fairly nominal amount, and based on that, um, I, I think we'll probably get to point um, Madam Chair about making a motion here, but I strongly support um, uh, any action to um, forestall uh, interest payments and other penalties. Um, did we want to have that, were you proposing that for tonight's agenda, Matt, or for the April 13th meeting? Well, I, I, I did put it on here. If the council would like to take action, we'd be happy to share that uh, with the public uh, as they call in because the calls are kind of starting to come or have been coming for a couple weeks. Uh, it, it is here and it's publicly posted. If the council would like to take such an action, you have that ability this evening. If the council would like to consider it for a couple more weeks and come back and talk about it on April, we could also let the public know that this is an item that'll be on the council agenda in April. Uh, for action as well. So you have the flexibility for either one if you would, which you, whatever the council would prefer. Yeah, um, I think we should probably, this is something we should probably act on sooner rather than later. Um, Penny, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think this is something we should act on uh, tonight. Um, I do have a really silly question, Matt, because <laughs> some of these little nuances I don't always understand. Um, and so this would, um, cover not just your uh, real estate property taxes, but uh, any taxes relative to machinery, et cetera? Okay. Yes, it'd be for uh, real estate, personal property, uh, either, either one of the two that we collect. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I would make a motion um, that uh, we move forward with, um, with deferring interest on um, property tax uh, payments until uh, June 1st, 2020, and that uh, we may revisit that based on um, where we are at from a coronavirus perspective at that point in time. Um, I see Aitlin's hand up. Is that, are you making a second? Yes. Okay, since we did just sort of move from discussion right into motion and we didn't have a chance for any public comment before we got there. Oh, um, sorry. That's okay. I, I do wanna just um, open it up to any public comment on that, um, on that item. And then we can, we can go forward from there. Uh, anyone, anyone in the public wishing to speak on this item? There's a question in the Q&A &A about excise taxes due in March, April, or May. 
I, I, I can speak on that if, if, you, if, if I may, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, so if, it's, if it is for a re-registration, uh, that can be done online. Uh, so a person can do that and that they should be able to receive their uh, tags through that. And we'd be happy to walk a person through uh, on that. Uh, as far as uh, April, uh, obviously we can do that if it's a re-reg for any of those three months. If it's a new, uh, new registration, like I said, uh, the state has uh, put in that if a person uh, has purchased a new car, that I think they have up to 30 days after the uh, registration expires or until the emergency has been uh, retired to, to take care of that. Uh, we may be able to process that for the April and May ones better than obviously than we can for March at this point. Uh, but with the, as March is waning, uh, there may, you know, a 10 day or 14 day plate would get them through with the month of March. So uh, we are happy to try to work with people when it comes to that. And we're currently working on plans to, to do that. But as far as, uh, uh, you know, those are, those are normal. There is not, there are not, or there is not interest charged on excise taxes when it's not paid on time. Uh, but we are trying to find ways to, to expedite that and help people through. And I think you're right, Matt, that the, per, per the state order, it's 30 days from the end of the emergency to register. So there is a little bit of a grace period. And like I say, after April 13th, we, we are planning to try to find mechanisms that we can help people through that and they can take care of it live and in person here at the town office. Um, okay, any other public comment or questions on this item before we move back to discussion? Seeing none. Um, okay, Caitlin, your hand is still up. Is that a discussion on the motion? No, it was, I didn't know I had to lower it. Okay, just your second. Uh, any discussion on um, Penny's motion? No, nope. uh, seeing none. So I'm guessing Deb now needs to call through this again. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Devereaux? Yes. Councilor Gabrielson? Yes. Councilor Garvin? Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Yes. Councilor Straw? Yes. Chairman Adams? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next item up on the agenda, um, I think we have Chief Fenton here for an update on police department actions and assistance to senior citizens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so I think like everybody else, there's no playbook for us here. We're kind of... Um, trying to remain flexible and innovative every day with the way we're doing things. But first off, I wanna make the public aware that uh, we have not and would not ever uh, reduce any of our services. We are still here for the public, no matter what their needs might be, that this station is still a safe haven. Uh, we are trying to take steps to mitigate officers' exposure, but at the same time, uh, the station always remains open to the public. If they have needs, they can come in, um, especially those exigent circumstances where there's an emergency. Uh, in terms of external, external steps we've been taking, we have slightly augmented our services and how we operate, but not at any cost to the citizens in terms of reduction of services. Once again, it's just augmentation, uh, not elimination um, of how we're approaching vehicles and uh, selecting our enforcement. Uh, there are, as we are uh, becoming aware, a county jail is limiting the amount of people that they're taking in for arrests. Court has also been uh, effectively shut down. So. Um, we are choosing to summons oftentimes rather than make an arrest, uh, things uh, such as that. Um, but we also are in constant contact with our community partners, um, most importantly DHS, uh, domestic violence advocates who typically aren't out in the field like they would be. Uh, so for example, I was on the phone today for 45 minutes with uh, through these doors, just ensuring that people that need services that can't be provided by those entities that we're doing it for them. And even if it means us bringing down a cell phone uh, to provide to someone to make sure that they're in constant communication with those resources. Um, and we still responded for regular calls for service. It's still busy and it seems to be amping up. We are getting some mental health calls. Uh, officers, for example, last night literally uh, took into protective custody an individual with a gun in his hand uh, when they encountered him down at Fort Williams. So those things, stressors, people being laid off, uh, they're starting to, uh, to cause an uptick in a little bit in our calls for service and the severity of the calls that we're going on. Um, in terms of the state emergency that put forth by Governor Mills, 
Um, we are looking at this right now. We're trying to utilize discretion and suggest educational measures uh, that include warning, providing a copy of orders, and just basically educating the public. We're looking for persuasion, not punishment. Uh, we're looking for that voluntary compliance. Um, we are in no way trying to criminalize activity that would normal would be normal under any other circumstances. Um, so once again, we're facing a public health crisis. We don't want to turn it into a public safety crisis in any way. Uh, internally, steps that we're taking is we're just encouraging officers who feel sick at all uh, are directed to stay stay home. Uh, we're logging officers are doing a, a wellness check when they check in for their shifts. They're logging their temperature uh, that fills out a form that clarifies that they're asymptomatic at the beginning of every shift. Uh, it allows us to take steps to ensure that officers aren't sick when they arrive, but also track if they do become symptomatic when those symptoms have started. Um, We've also increased the cleaning schedule for the station and for the cruisers uh, to multiple times per shift, uh, discontinued trainings and meetings like a lot of other people have, increased our availability and access to PPEs when needed. Uh, and we're currently looking at some contingency schedules should we have a staffing shortage to ensure that we're not gonna eliminate any services provided to our citizens and also minimize overtime as those things uh, come forward, uh, kind of planning for worst case scenarios. Uh, because at the end of the day, law enforcement officers are in some ways irreplaceable uh, and we have to come to work. <laughs> we're also looking at some uh, different special programs and we're utilizing our community officer and also our SRO who's been freed up. Uh, the SRO has been uh, working a lot of road shifts to try to minimize overtime. Uh, I think we've got it down to pretty much zero for the last couple of weeks because he is covering those shifts. But when he is freed up, he's working with our community liaison. Uh, for example, today they were working with the schools to help deliver food to in, uh, food insecure families. Uh, we've also, as everyone is aware, been doing the birthday parades, which might sound like they're ending now. But uh, while they lasted, they were a very uh, positive interaction for the officers and uh, first responders and, uh, and the youth in the community. Um, but one of the most important things we're doing right now is contacting seniors within our community to see if they have any needs that we can meet for them. We're also connecting them with services and providing services if need be. And that can be anything from picking up prescriptions, picking up food, shoveling their driveway. Uh, there's a lot of questions around taxes as we were talking about earlier tonight. Uh, we're signing some seniors up for Great Starts, which is an, a program we've had here at the station for years where we're uh, basically senior citizens who don't have other family members in the area can call in and check in with us in the morning. And if we don't get a call by noon, we go and check in on them to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, but at the end of the day, I think uh, this segment of the population often experiences a lot of feelings of loneliness, fear, anxiety, and isolation. If nothing else, the phone calls just uh, reaffirm to them that we are here and we're able to provide needs, if nothing else, than just an ear. Uh, and they're in college, encouraged to call us. Uh, you know, even if they're doing okay today, it doesn't mean they're gonna be doing okay three days from now, five days from now. Um, so officers have been uh, reaching out to them. Like I said, I think we've reached out to over 400 citizens thus far. I think our target is a little bit over 700. So we're in the process. And I think once we stop, we'll just continue uh, based on our conversations earlier, kind of have a priority list of those we might want to go back and check in with those who, who might mention that they've missed the meal or that they don't have a family member in the area. We're kind of highlighting those with a different color to make sure that we're, we're, we're coming back to them uh, as we redo the list again to make sure that they're, they're hitting the top of the list, those people that we, have, we think might be lacking any type of resources. Um, so that's what we're doing with that program. Um, at the end of the day, it's about the staff here. I cannot say enough about it. It's not me, it's, it's the staff. We are, we are very fortunate to have a, a very dedicated and loyal staff. I've heard absolutely zero complaints since this has started. I've only heard what can I do to help. Um, they are uh, out there 24 seven, uh, and this is a unique situation. This is, there's a fear that's added with this one. Usually we go to dangerous situations and go home safely. Sometimes now we're worried about bringing something home to our family. So even with that anxiety, officers are still here just being extra um, cautious about cleaning down the station, cleaning their cruisers, making sure they're wiping stuff down. They're taking those steps. Um, but at the end of the day, we're very fortunate to have the staff that we have. They're very loyal and dedicated staff that I cannot speak highly enough about. Um, and that's kind of where we're at to this point. If there's any questions I can answer about any of the programs, I'm more than happy to. Um, yeah, anybody have questions for the chief? Um, I, I don't know which of you is first, Jeremy and Penny. Uh -huh. Thank you. Go for it, Penny. Oh. Okay. I just wanted to say that um, uh, Paul and I talked earlier today because something that um, I think you know is very important to me is the number of food insecure people in our town. 
Um, and so um, the wonderful thing is, is that the police department has already uh, been able to reach a number of seniors. And so um, I'm going to try, I'm going to stay connected with Paul so we can identify what are some of the things that we can do to ensure that our seniors are not uh, food insecure. And I know there are programs out there. I know there's Meals on Wheels and there's all of those things, but sometimes the community needs to come together and put some other mechanisms in place. The other thing we talked about is the level of food insecurity when children are home from school. And uh, yes, there are meals getting to the uh, kids who are in, um, who have been identified as um, or free and reduced uh, lunch, but there's a whole population of young people who fall outside of that uh, spectrum. Uh, that are, are their families are probably experiencing some level of insecurity. And those are the things that I think and that I hope to do over the next um, uh, several days or week or whatever is to really start to reach out and identify what is needed out there. Because yes, there are food pantries. Yes, there are a number of things, but I think there are some other things that we can do. I don't know. Um, I know that there is going to be more SNAP benefits available to families, which I think we then need to get out there and encourage them to be participating in, in those kind of programs. So those are the things that are, uh, I think, need to be on our radar screen is making sure that our community is fed. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, no, my, my question slash comment also had to do with the food insecurity um, concerns. Uh, and just it, it, my observation would be that a lot of the measures that uh, grocery stores and, and other food outlets have put in place to help people access food with reduced risk of, of contracting the virus um, tends to be technologically driven. Um, you know, things like signing up for orders online and, and then going to pick up food. And so I, uh, in one, on the one hand, I'm curious um, to hear from the chief if you heard from residents um, through your outreach about, uh, particular, about families that have expressed concern around food procurement. Um, and then also as a follow on to that, you know, to the extent that that is an issue that you're seeing, um, I would be highly supportive of, you know, whether it's the police department or other, other uh, town employees um, working with Matt to try and find ways to, to help bridge that technological gap that may exist for some people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Officer Estes and, and Officer Galvin have been doing the bulk of the phone calls. To this point, we have not uh, spoken to a whole bunch of people who have been uh, feeling as though they do not have access, but my concern okay. is as, as anxiety rises about even being out, that they might not want to even venture out to even do a curbside pickup or something else. So we're, we're definitely going to be there in some level, even if it means for us to drive the cruiser down and grab some food for them, we're more than willing to do that. Um, you know, knowing my staff, uh, they'll be buying groceries for them before you know it. And uh, uh, But we're going to make sure that the citizens are being taken care of, for sure, from a technological standpoint, but also from if it just needs us to go get it, then we're just going to do that. We're, um, we're fortunate right now with our staffing levels uh, that we have an officer pretty much dedicated to that every day um, to making sure those needs are met. And he's very familiar with the different services that are out there to make sure that we're providing them. And, um, and Matt and I even had some conversations today about just trying to find some uh, finances if needed uh, to make sure that people are secure, but uh, we're working on it and we'll always ensure that. Thank you. And we're also working with the schools as well. Um, Officer Galvin has a great connection with the schools and he was there today with him, he and Officer Estes actually today uh, for students that were uh, food insecure that they were delivering meals for them today. So they're also in constant contact about students who might have, you know, with the counselors at school, uh, Officer Galvin has a great relationship. So they need students that just might, might need a check in just might need Officer Galvin. Um, he's out doing those things as well, just checking in with some at-risk youth or some people who might be having some issues at home. Who uh, And those kids are also reaching out, I think, to some staff at the schools who are always in communication with Officer Galvin, because even if they're not here physically, he can kind of go do those well-being checks. And he's got that rapport with the kids that they they, they welcome his um, showing up at the doors, the, opposed to some guys in uniform that might not like to see. They always like to see Officer Galvin. So. 
Thank you. And thanks to all of your officers too for, for their hard work right now. Sounds like you guys are doing a great job. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna move quickly on and have, have Deb do an update on the election process and then open up for um, comments or questions from the public for, for both of them after the council's had a chance to ask Deb any questions. Great, thank you very much, Chairman Adams. I just wanted to just briefly mention, as Matt said, at least until April 13th, uh, we are manning the phones here in the office and processing mail, uh, both in the tax office and the town clerk's office, my office. Um, as you know, virtually everything we do, we are agents of the state. So we eagerly await any updates from the state on how to handle certain things. Early on, we did hear from the Office of Vital Records um, to help us with uh, vital records requests, um, paperwork that's needed if we do have any residents that pass away, marriage licenses, et cetera. So we are following uh, their guidelines and we're happy to do, uh, excuse me, happy to hear from them uh, early on. Um, in terms of elections, um, we are actually still working on the March 3rd election. We had uh, approximately 500 changes to the voter list. So entering, they might have been enrollments or address changes, new residents, uh, name changes, et cetera. So we're still working. Well, that actually that piece is completed. Our uh, deputy clerk, uh, Kathy Maxwell, is now working on the voter participation list. Every voter that voter voted, we have to enter them into the system. So she is still working and reconciling that, which is quite um, a project on its own. So again, we're still working on, on March 3rd. Um, as far as June 9th, uh, that is a big question. I wait eagerly every day to hear from the Secretary of State's office. I believe they are making recommendations now to the governor. I have no idea what that's going to look like. Um, you know, is June 9th still the date? I don't know. If it's not the date, that has implications for us because we try to have our school referendum vote on the same date. So that could be problematic. Um, what will be the protocols um, you know, for the election? You hear other states talking about more of a mail-in you know, type ballot. I have no idea if the state is looking you know, for that. I mean, we have the ability now, but whether or not that will enhance that and what that will look like, um, I really don't know. So unfortunately, as of right now, um, I don't have anything specific from the state. I do know that, you know, whenever that election is, we'll certainly be looking at, you know, protocols for not only social distancing, but reuse of pens, wiping down, you know, surfaces, voting booths and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I think even beyond, I mean, we, we wipe down here when we work and I, I think that will continue even after the virus. I think we have a kind of a, uh, new insight to that and what we should be doing every day anyway. So and that will certainly carry through the election. But um, as I say, every day, we're hoping in the next few days to hear. Um, and then we'll just have to take it one step at a time and, and see what impact particularly there may or may not be uh, on when uh, we have our school budget vote that is scheduled right now for June 9th as well. Thanks, Deb. So it sounds like a developing situation and we'll just have to wait for some guidance from the state. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Jeremy, yes, go ahead. Just one question on June 9th, whether uh, we go ahead with that date or not, thinking about, um, you know, not just uh, proximity, but shared resources and things that people are, are touching. <laughs> um, We've always had those pens hanging from a string in the voting booth. Um, is there is there an opportunity for us to, you know, have people use their own pens or something else like that, or are we are we stuck with the the felt tip pens that? Well, as you know, as as I I mentioned, reuse of pens is something we'll have to look at. I mean, if we look at there are certain pens that the state wants us to use. So if we have folks use their own, it might not be the preferred uh you know uh pen so you know if we're expecting three thousand voters do we buy three thousand pens perhaps um but that certainly is something we're going to look at absolutely thanks 
Um, okay. Anyone from the public with questions for the chief or Deb? I do see we had a, a question in the Q and A. Um, that's been there for quite a while. Yeah, uh, looks like that's yeah, that's a different sort of question. All right. Um, any other questions from from the public on um, either of those items? Okay. I don't see anyone. So there was one last item um, that we just wanted to to touch on. Um, I can I can just cover it. You can add anything you have, Matt. Um, but uh, the council did receive an update from Clint Sweat about the the tax revaluation um, or the property revaluation, and that that will now be postponed until spring of next year. We had received some emails from residents who are a little bit concerned. Uh, the timing was not great about the letters going out um, to residents about, you know, strangers coming into their homes. So um, wisely, that will be delayed for a year. And, and Clint did give us an update that he's going to continue to, to do some prep work in the meantime. So, you know, he'll be ready to go when uh, it's a more appropriate time for that. Um, anything to add to that, Matt? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I know Clint will be doing outreach to the entire community. Uh, yeah, talk about the world changing in three weeks' time. He sent out his notification that the process was about to begin and then everything unfolded after that. And so, uh, you know, obviously we're very sensitive to the fact that uh, there's a high level of concern. And, uh, you know, as once again, as being your former assessor and remembering the 2007 He's in a similar position that, that I was at the time and watching the market have a, a great amount of uncertainty. Uh, it's, it's a real challenge to try to use data that A, will not be very, uh, may or may not be very sufficient to help them come up with a successful product and B, just to looking at uh, what the concerns are from, so, from a social and health standpoint right now. Uh, it's easy, it was the easiest choice I think we've made this year was to say, you know what, this can be pushed a year and uh, we'll come back and, and start over. And he will continue the work that he's doing in the background uh, as far as updating uh, his tables and doing sketches and some of the work that he needs to have done on the software side. So it, you know, again, we look at opportunities that come from challenges. And I think this is giving us the opportunity to do a lot of work that he might have felt uh, a little bit of tr uh, pressure to try to, to get done. And this gives him the ability to get that done I think with a higher level of accuracy as well. So, uh, you know, I, I will say it was an easy decision for him. And I know a lot of it's on the for, forefront of a lot of residents' minds. And uh, we want to provide them some peace of mind that they will not have to have that as, a, as an item to be concerned with. Plus, the level of equity across, across the board in town uh, is such that you're, you're, you're not looking at segments that may be paying an, uh, an artificially greater share or an artificially lower share than what their property tax burden should be. So uh, that's, that also helped in the, uh, in the decision making process. Thank you. Um, okay, so last item on the agenda is opportunity for public comment since we had public comment on each of the items as they came up. Um, this will now be the opportunity for public comment on anything not on the agenda. Seeing no one from the public who's raising anything. Um, thank you everyone for participating and that was kind of a, a long meeting, but I think those were all important updates. I think people have been looking for answers, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, Chris, yes, did you have something? So our next scheduled meeting is April 13th, which obviously in a normal world would be um, plenty of, <laughs> be too soon almost. Um, <laughs> do we anticipate that we're going to be having another one of these virtual or special meetings in the next two weeks or so before April 13th? Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, the thought, if I may, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, the thought would be that uh, April 8th and 9th uh, budget workshops would take place via the Zoom room. And then uh, I would, looking at where the governor's recommendations have been so far, you may want to anticipate uh, a council meeting April 13th as well uh, via the Zoom chat. But uh, if circumstances change to allow that uh, ability to, to do uh, 
an in person then uh, that that you know we we could cross that bridge at that time. We're fully ready to. We have taken steps downstairs to try to promote uh, adequate space for folks to to do. But the uh, obviously with the council, we're looking at a pretty tighter window uh, that that we have for seating that we can work on there. But we are looking to try to continue the electronic format if if necessary. Right. I think the question was maybe more about uh, whether we're going to have another meeting like this. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, so, and I would just say, it's probably something we should address as a, I mean, in, in, in pandemic days, every day is a long day. So, <laughs> as, yeah. as, as you and I have talked, Madam Chair, uh, two weeks ago, it was, okay, let's just get through today. Uh, and then it was get through the weekend and then let's get through a week. So right now we're looking to get through the month of March and things have changed, been changing at, at such a rapid speed and we are trying to uh, respond versus react and come forward with our best approaches. So uh, that is a huge challenge and things are changing daily as we as we all see. Yeah, I think we have to play it by ear. Uh, Jamie, yep, did you have a um, I, I would say a couple of things. Number one is that if new information dictates, then obviously we should um, use this as a great opportunity to efficiently communicate with people. Um, if there's not necessarily, um, you know, relevant information for us to be talking about and opining on, then I don't, I don't know that there's extra value that we're necessarily adding above and beyond what some of the other um, uh, agencies and, and resources are. So um, that's one thing. Uh, on a related point, though, I, I do have a question about um, resumption of some of the other um, council committee work um, that had been uh, abruptly halted with, um, uh, you know, with uh, all the cancellations that we had to make. So thinking specifically about the work that the ordinance committee was hip deep in um, and things like that, and whether or not um, uh, either Matt, you or or Penny, you as the chair of that committee, have had any thoughts about resuming that in a virtual manner? I know Maureen and I did speak about that uh, today uh, specifically, and I think uh, I think she shall be reaching out to the chair to see what her desire is to to go forward as far as scheduling and uh, seeing if this approach would work based on the numbers that you have. And looking at, you know, we, at, at times tonight, we had uh, upwards in the mid 50s uh, attending the meeting. So uh, I think the format uh, would flex as far as being able to meet the needs. It's just a question of, uh, of trying to moderate the meeting. But, uh, but otherwise, I think, you know, I, I would trust the chair and uh, Maureen to, to work that forward. But we'd like to get some of those back on board, especially those that like ordinance specifically that has uh, some timetables that they're trying to work on. Uh, can I say something? Yeah. Um, I had been, uh, Jamie, I'd been thinking about that and I wanted to see how this on um, uh, this forum went tonight, this meeting went tonight. I think, I think we could do it and I think we could do it effectively um, because I think it is something that we need to continue to move forward on so that we can um, um, get it done and kind of move on to other ordinance. Um, issues that we need to be dealing with. Um, so my thought was that we would uh, pick that work up fairly soon. Great. Uh, Chris, did you have something to add before we? Uh, so uh, I'll just note uh, John Boltz's comment um, in re reference to this was considering meeting more often. But what we have um, currently, it's not on the online calendar yet, but it sounds like the next thing is that uh, Tentatively, there is going to be, it sounds like a town council meeting on the 8th for the, uh, to deal with at, at a minimum uh, budget workshop stuff. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Eighth or ninth? Yeah. All right. Eighth and ninth. All right. So uh, to the extent uh, John or anyone else was like, oh, you know, you guys should be meeting more uh, frequently as uh, a number of you noted, it's like, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be flying. Uh, we'll be dealing with things as they come up, but otherwise we will be getting together at a minimum on the 8th or the 9th, which is about, what, two weeks from now? So yes. 14 days, all right. Yeah, um, uh, Jeremy and then Jamie. Um, and I, I would just add to that, that, that um, Valerie and Matt, if you become aware of any issues in between now and April 9th that you think require more urgent council action, um, 
I, I would be in favor of calling another meeting like this. Um, you know, but uh, Matt, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, thus far you and the, and the department heads have done an excellent job of exercising your discretion to, to take the necessary steps um, that, that we needed to take as a town. So, you know, I, I continue to support the actions that, and the approach that you guys have been taking. Yeah, and I think Matt and I will just have to stay in touch about things as they, I mean, we don't know what's gonna happen from one day to the next, so we'll play it by ear. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Yeah, that, I, I don't know if I was misunderstood. I, I'm, uh, my point is it, it, we're not, uh, uh, you know, a function of government or an agency that's in the business of providing sort of the daily briefing style. Um, and so, or, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure on a weekly basis. Um, there was a question from another citizen who's been on the call um, that uh, was in the Q&A room about holding a bi-monthly, so twice monthly session like this. I think we can take that up and discuss that as a group. And, you know, if we feel that that's a good sort of efficient cadence and schedule. Um, I, at, at this point, I would say that conditions on the ground um, should be what guides us in, in how urgently we meet next, but and, yeah. and what and what we have to add to that conversation. Yeah. All right. If I if I may, Madam Chair, I just I I will. Uh, I know early on I was sending some epic uh, emails to the council uh, that was uh, trying to get as much information, and as I get my information, I do forward it to the council as as rapidly as possible. So. Uh, I want the public to know that we are, you know, we do have open lines of communication and uh, we are doing our best to share information as well as via our website uh, as things change as well and getting out up there and promoting it. And uh, I did want to take the opportunity to thank all of the department heads who have been working and uh, doing a great job for us. And, uh, you know, it may seem dark and it may seem uh, that we have enormous challenges ahead of us. We, the town has great leadership with an awesome council. And uh, we will get through this. We'll come back, and we will be stronger and uh, better, better for the experience. But it, it will take all of our best efforts to get where we need to be. And I think I have enormous confidence in you guys. And uh, and it's a pleasure to work work for you and uh, on behalf of the citizens of the town. So thanks for that. Yeah. Thank you, Matt, and thanks also to the department heads and everyone. Um, so if anyone else has questions, in the meantime, feel free to email us. We're all available to answer questions and this will just be moving forward. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting? So moved. Yeah. So, sorry, who seconded? Caitlin. Okay. Um, Deb, do we need a roll call on this? <laughs> Actually, technically, I guess we do. <laughs> uh, any, any discussion on the motion to return? <laughs> <laughs> um, you want me to do the roll call? Yes, please. Okay. Councilor Devereaux. Yes. Councilor Gabrielson. Yes. Councilor Garvin. Yes. Councilor Caitlin Jordan. Yes. Councilor Penelope Jordan. I'm not sure I'm having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Straw? Yes. And Chairman Adams? Yes. <laughs> All right, we're done. Motion okay. passes. Great. Great. Right, take care. Everyone. Well done. Okay. Let's see.